Can I welcome everyone to the 31st meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. As meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. This is the seventh and final day of... Yes, yes. If I could crave your indulgence and uh, that you and the committee would allow me to uh, keep my phone on vibrate as my niece is currently in labour. Yes, that would be fine. Thank you. Uh, and I hope we get the good news at some stage towards the end of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, this is the seventh and final day of stage two of the planning bill. I welcome the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. Some MSPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again be in attendance today and are very welcome. Uh, <clears throat> I call Amendment 334 in the name of John Finney and a group on its own. John Finney to move and speak to Amendment 334, although Andy, I believe you're going to move. Right. I will convene. Yes, thank you very much. I'm speaking on behalf of John Finney's Amendment 334, uh, which I now move, but I will be seeking leave to withdraw. Um, enforcement charters seek to ensure that the police pays principle is adhered to through periodic compliance uh, reporting. The collapse of Scottish Coal in 2013 left an estimated restoration funding shortfall of 200 million and significant <coughs> negative impacts on communities and the environment. And a central issue in that was the ad lack of adequate periodic compliance monitoring. Um, Amendment 334 introduces compliance monitoring, including assessments of the extent to which developments are covered by financial guarantees and a requirement that such reports be made available to the public. Such measures would have proved useful, I would have thought, in, for example, Donald Trump's golf course development um, at many. Um, I'll, le I'll leave matters there. As I say, I, I will be seeking leave to withdraw this amendment. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Does any other member for contribution? No, uh, Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I spoke with uh, Mr Finney yesterday, uh, and while I do not doubt Mr Finney's good intentions, uh, this amendment would place a significant burden on planning authorities, uh, which would divert planning enforcement resources away from resolving actual breaches of planning control. Uh, the amendment makes uh, no distinctions relating to the type or age of the development or the potential impact of any breach of conditions. Um, it would require planning authorities to report on the status of every major development in their area four times a year without any exceptions, whether the development has yet to commence or is in progress or has been completed. Uh, for example, uh, a grant of permission for a housing estate uh, built 10 years ago uh, might include a condition that the grass and a strip of land was to be cut twice a year. Uh, that condition would have no end date. So under the proposed amendment, uh, the planning authority would have to report four times a year on the status of that housing estate and how it was monitoring that condition. Uh, and presumab presumably, if it, it found the grass was only cut once a year, uh, it would have to report on what action it would take against the householders as the condition transfers with ownership of the land. Uh, this may seem a, a trivial or absurd example, but it is the effect of having such a broad provision. Uh, compliance with a, a grant of planning permission is ultimately the responsibility of the developer or the owner of any particular site. And I believe that planning authorities are best placed to take decisions locally on developments, conditions and obligations, uh, which need close monitoring and how to do that. Um, I recognise that some developments, such as mineral workings, are a different case from buildings, uh, as planning conditions may relate to their ongoing operations and restoration uh, once they cease operating. Uh, they may well be the kind of development that planning authorities could be expected to monitor more regularly, but even so, that monitoring should be proportionate and based on risk for each case. Uh, I do not support the uh, amendment uh, as it stands. Um, I, as I say, I have spoken to Mr <coughs> Finney um, and have made some suggestions around about talking to officials uh, about uh, trying to get the true intention uh, of the uh, uh, amendment in better shape for Stage 3. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Andy Whiteman to wind up and press a withdraw. Uh, nothing further to say. Withdraw the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, and the Whiteman wishes to withdraw this amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Oh, thank you. 
I call Amendment 267 in the name of the Minister and a group in its own. Minister, to move and speak to, to Amendment 267. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, this is a largely technical amendment. Section 23 of the Bill introduces powers for a planning authority or the Scottish Ministers to register a charging order where they have taken action to ensure compliance with a planning enforcement notice or amenity notice. Uh, this will help to ensure that the costs of taking action are recovered, which should in turn encourage authorities to take action. Uh, new Section 158D, inserted by Section 23 of the Bill, requires that a charging, charging order must be in a, a form prescribed in regulations. Uh, this helps Registers of Scotland by ensuring that all the correct information is provided in a standard format. This amendment inserts the same requirement in relation to the document discharging the order once payment has been made. And I move Amendment 267 in my name, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to wind up? Uh, I'm happy, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 267 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The, therefore, Amendment 267 is agreed to. The question is that Section 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. I call Amendment 310 in the name of Andy <coughs> Whiteman. Already debated with Amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 311 in the name of Andy Whiteman. Already debated with Amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 312 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 326. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Excuse me. Uh, moved. The question, uh, the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, yes. Those in favour of Amendment 23? Five, a four, sorry, and those opposed? Three, Amendment 23 is agreed to. <coughs> I call Amendment 61 in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 55. Alexander Stewart, to move or not move? Move. The question is, that Amendment 61 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 61? Four, those opposed? Three, Amendment 61 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 313 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 326. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 326. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 24 is agreed to. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 268 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 326. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 268 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. no. Those in favour of Amendment 268? Those opposed? The Amendment 268 uh, falls 4 3. I call Amendment 148 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 55. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 148 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <coughs> amendment 148 is agreed to. I call Amendment 149 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 55. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 149 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is agreed unanimously. Uh, I call Amendment 150 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 55. And I remind members that if Amendment 150 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 62 and 63 because of preemption. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, Convener. Okay, the question is that Amendment 150 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 150 is agreed to unanimously. Uh, <coughs> I call Amendment 17 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 326. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 17? Five. Those opposed? Two. Amendment 17 is agreed to. Hmm? I call Amendment 269 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 269 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, 
Uh, convener, this is a group of technical amendments uh, which I hope will be uncontroversial. Uh, Amendment 269 simply makes it clear that different provision can be made in regulations uh, and that they may make different provision for different areas. Amendment 157 provides for certain regulation making powers to be subject to the affirmative procedure. It currently covers regulations under Section 251B, introduced by Section 26 of the Bill, about the appointment and functions and reports submitted by the National Pl Planning Performance Coordinator and regulations under Paragraph 3 of New Schedule 5A, amending the places where a master plan consent area may not be made. It also refers to Section 3AB2, uh, which would have been included by Amendment 116 had that been agreed. Um, clearly, this will need to be tidied up at stage three, uh, and I would suggest it would all, could also include other powers which have been inserted during stage two, which are subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, but I would ask the committee to agree this amendments today to implement the government's commitments uh, on the powers listed. Uh, amendment 275 is to assist clarity in the legislation. It provides that ministers may, by regulations, amend certain provisions. So rather than referring to the date on which something came into force, it will give the actual date. Uh, this will save readers having to go back and find out when a particular provision was commenced, which is not always easy. Uh, I would ask the committee to agree to these technical amendments, convener. Thank you very much. Does anybody, are there any other member want to comment? No. In that case, Minister, would you like the opportunity to wind up? Uh, I'm fine, thank you, convener. Okay. The question is that Amendment 269 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, amendment 269 is agreed to. I call Amendment 151 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment <coughs> 55. And Minister, to move formally. Moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 151 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, Amendment 151 is agreed to. I call Amendment 158 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 184. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, Convener. The question is, Amendment 158 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 158. Yes? Yes. yes. Amendment 158 is agreed to. I call Amendment 18 in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 326. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 18, please. Three. Those opposed? Four. Amendment 18 falls. Okay. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 330 and 322. <coughs> Graham Simpson to move Amendment 19 and speak to all amendments in the group. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Convener. I'll formally move uh, Amendment 19. Um, this revises the 1997 Act uh, and would beef up protections for national scenic areas. The Act currently reads, uh, where it appears to the Scottish Ministers that an area is of outstanding scenic value in a national context and that the special protection measures specified in subsection 2 are appropriate for it, they may by direction designate the area as a national scenic area. Where any area for the time being designated as a national scenic area, special attention is to be paid to the desirability of safeguarding or enhancing its character or appearance in the exercise. <coughs> Removing the words the desirability of would give an extra level of protection to these areas. The phrase is in itself uh, subjective Wording needs to be tight in legislation, as we've seen throughout stage two, uh, and this is not. Uh, the minister could regard it as desirable to safeguard or enhance the character of an area, while someone else could take the opposite view. Removing the words would leave the paragraph reading that, quote, special attention is to be paid to safeguarding or enhancing its character or appearance in the exercise. And I think that's more robust uh, and I'm backed on this by the National Trust for Scotland. Um, so that's that amendment. Um, I'd like to discuss Alex Cole's uh, Hamilton's Amendment 322, uh, which deals with wild lands. Um, now, we all value the wild lands of Scotland Convener. They're among uh, some of the most diverse uh, natural uh, environments in Europe. Uh, the rap rapid expansion of onshore wind farms has led to the 
worrying infringement of wild land, often fra fragile ecosystems and peatland are disturbed uh, by the installation and operation of wind turbines. Uh, and we think it's uh, inappropriate and the unique designation of wild land, along with their special protection measures, should be adhered to. Adhered to. However, uh, I do have concerns around the drafting of Mr. Cole Hamilton's uh, amendment. There's a lack of clarity wild, around the wild land definition. What does the amendment mean by, for example, semi-natural? Uh, will there be a consultation to, to, to determine where this provision should be uh, appropriately applied. Would you take an intervention? Yes. I'm grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Um, I, I think when I was working with clerks to draft this amendment, we felt a lot of those questions could be answered in statutory guidance behind the bill uh, to determine what the definition of semi-rural meant. Uh, it was not necessary for the, the, front, the face of the bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is mention in the amendment of Scottish natural heritage. Uh, have they been asked if they're happy with it? I haven't heard from them. Um, are we in danger of cutting off our noses to spite our faces here? Uh, much of the highlands could be considered wild land. If we're saying no to any development in these areas, then there's a danger of thwarting change, which may be welcomed by locals and be economically beneficial. Uh, now, convener, I wouldn't normally quote a community council here, uh, but I was quite taken by the submission from Donald Campbell, the chair of Durness Community Council. Mr Campbell said, the proposed wildland policy risks having a detrimental effect on development and sustainability within our communities. The current regime works, he says. In wildland area 34, Ray Castley wildland area, we have two hydro power stations, a commercial fish farm and a telecom station. And yet this is considered by SNH to be wild land. The income from these projects will encourage the estates to diversify their activities, becoming more self-sufficient and creating numerous jobs. This is important in ensuring that the jobs created will be supported over the long term. Uh, close quotes. And Community Land Scotland say the amendment, if passed, could have a, quote, significantly detrimental impact on rural repopulation. Uh, due to these concerns, the convener, uh, I'm un unable to support the amendment. I've uh, finished. Uh, okay, thank you, Graham. Uh, Rhoda Grant, speak to Amendment 330 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, recently published research, research report by Community Land Scotland and Inherit, the Institute of Heritage and Sustainable Human Development, found that communities feel locked out of Scottish landscape policy due to the participation deficit that leaves des the designation process largely the preserve of landscape professionals. This community participation deficit identified by Community Land Scotland and Inherit report is contrary to the principle of community <coughs> empowerment that was legally enshrined by this parliament. And in order that these designations work properly, local people must have ownership of them and should be involved in how the designations are managed and operated. If I can just um, quote a little from the report, the interviews indicated that there is a strong sense of exclusion from the process of assessing and designating landscapes and from making key decisions about landscape matters. It goes on, the interviews indicated that the effects of this deficit can be subtle but profound. Exclusion breeds a sense of insecurity security and alienation as people feel locked out of decisions that affect their lives and feel that things that matter to them are not being recognised. Amendment 330 only applies to national scenic areas. It seeks to involve communities by putting an obligation on Scottish ministers to consult with them with regard to the management of local designations and to report on that consultation as part of their annual report. While this amendment focuses on national scenic areas, uh, there may be scope at stage three to extend its coverage to include all natural heritage and historic designations if there was an appetite within the Parliament for that to happen. I'm keen to hear the committee's views and those of the Minister as to whether they agree with this principle 
and would also be agreeable to extend this to all designations. If I can turn just quickly to um, Amendment 322 and reiterate um, the concerns that this amendment might have on repopulation, something I've spoken before the committee about in the past. Uh, I think it's really important that we look at repopulating those areas. Many people say they're wild lands. Actually, they have been managed through the generations. And recently, I heard um, a, a presentation about the impact crofting has on lands. Those are not wild lands. They're ma lands that have been managed in the past. And if we don't encourage that management and indeed encourage people to move back into those areas and manage them, then we will, we, we, we will not have those lands that we seek to, to protect. Thank you very much. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to Amendment 322 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the committee. Um, it's been great sharing this experience with you. Um, I move 322 in my name. Um, I'd like to start by saying this is not an assault on onshore wind farm development, nor is it an assault on the growth or repopulation of remote and rural communities. Um, there is a view, I think, that is widely held across stakeholders and the general public that we could be doing more to recognise and protect areas of wildland in Scotland. Indeed, there is empirical evidence of that in a variety of opinion polls which show that the, the public don't believe we've done enough to take this agenda forward. I would... Yes? Um, yeah, the member refers to the general public, but I wonder what consultation the member has had on his <coughs> amendment with the people of the Highlands. Well, I've had uh, quite a good deal of correspondence, in, and I freely admit that opinion is split on this, but um, but it, that is politics, and we have to pick a side, and I, I choose to um, press the issue to protect and recognise wild land. I would not be bringing this amendment if I thought this was an assault on uh, onshore wind farms. I, I passionately believe we do need to do more to encourage and uh, develop onshore wind, um, and so too do I recognise the need to repopulate and grow our existing rural communities. This is not a barrier to that. This is a power to ministers, not a duty. It is a tool in their arsenal who will naturally be aware of the competing demands of our climate change targets and indeed our housing development targets and the, the needs of sustaining and, and repopulating remote and rural communities. It is not something, a decision that they would take in isolation of those, but gives them the opportunity to uh, define and protect areas of wildland. Wildland defines us as a nation. People think of Scotland and they think of wildland, whether that is um, through what they see in uh, Hollywood movies or in, in their own uh, photographs from tourist holidays. It is, it is something that draws people to us and it is an important part of our ecosystem as well. I am the RSPB species champion of the rusty sphagnum bog moss. They call me the moss boss. Um, and that is hugely, is the sphagnum bog moss is a hugely important indicator of the CO2 storage capacity of our peat bogs. And the moss is <laughs> itself, of course, exceedingly efficient in absorbing CO2. And it is peat bogs in particular, which were one of my primary drivers for supporting uh, the inclusion of this amendment. So to conclude, uh, convener um, and fellow members of the committee, it is a power to ministers, not a duty. They will recognise that this comes not in isolation, but they have to balance against priorities both for onshore wind development and indeed the repopulation and growth of our remote and rural communities. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just say that we uh, welcome you sharing this experience with us. Uh, Annabelle, you wish to speak yes, in thank then. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I would like to make some comments specifically about Amendment uh, 322, and I, I, I will not be uh, supporting this. I do not believe that you can rule out in all circumstances development uh, on such land, and I would ask what about the right of the people of remote rural communities to have homes uh, and to be able to continue uh, uh, to croft. Uh, I, I quote in that regard, Issy McPhail, a land expert and resident in Assent, uh, uh, who uh, described the wildlife land designations impinging on common grazings uh, uh, of North Assent, Assent, and she told Community Land Scotland at the AGM in Stirling in May of this year, uh, and I quote, this so-called wild land is our domestic space for food harvest. So that was the view of, uh, certainly... I'm grateful to the member for taking an intervention on that point. I, I absolutely recognise that point of view, and I, I share that point of view. This is not um, a, a, a block or a barrier 
um, to the wishes of the people of the Highlands. This is a new power to ministers who will not take that decision in a vacuum. They will take a, a decisions if decisions are needed to be taken with full cognizance of the views of the, the person of which you, who, you just spoke. Uh, well, I, I hear what the member sa says, but of course, whilst it's important to, to have champions of various species, it's also important to have champions for people, people in our most rural and remote communities. And I think that you would find, if you had conducted a, wild, uh, a wide consultation with people in the Highlands, that perhaps they didn't quite take the same view uh, as the member on the matter. If I could quote also from uh, a letter I think we all received from Scottish Renewables on, on this particular amendment. Uh, and uh, they say, and I quote, the broad definition of wild land, and they go on to say, could conceivably exclude the development of any onshore wind, hydropower, solar or bioenergy scheme in Scotland. Uh, and they conclude uh, that, uh, uh, therefore, indeed, a blanket designation like that set out in the proposed amendment to the bill could have a very detrimental impact mm. on progress towards Scotland's renewable energy and climate change targets. I think those are very serious considerations to be taken into account indeed. And so for all the reasons that I have just explained to Convener, I will not be supporting uh, Mr Cole Hamilton's amendment. Thank you very much, Honourable Andy. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Uh, briefly on Amendment 330, um, I, I, I don't see the, the need um, for um, that amendment. On Amendment 322, wild land areas, we, we, we could, if we had the time, debate this for a very long time. It's a quite a substantial uh, policy question. Um, as Mr Cole Hamilton knows, the wild land concept already has a role in the planning system. Um, and this amendment would essentially, um, were ministers to be minded to actually implement the power they're being given, um, put that on a statutory footing. Uh, I'm not persuaded at this moment that that is an appropriate thing to do. Um, I'm sympathetic uh, to the notion, but it is a major policy change to uh, create a new statutory designation, or rather to give ministers the powers um, uh, to do that. Um, I say I'm sympathetic, but I also have um, quite substantial problems with the very concept um, of wild land. I, I always have done, and I, I say that as someone who used to be a trustee of the John Muir Trust. Um, as SNH say in its landscape policy in existing wild land areas, and I quote, measuring wildness is inherently difficult as it's a sub subjective <laughs> quality experienced differently uh, by different uh, people. Um, so the decision we have before us today is a fairly straightforward decision as to whether, in fact, we uh, follow Mr. Cole Hamilton's proposition that this should be put on a statutory footing or not. Uh, I'm not persuaded this is the time um, to do that. I'm not persuaded that the argument has been sufficiently um, rehearsed and debated. Um, I see arguments on both sides, um, but I'm not persuaded at this stage. So I'll be voting against uh, both uh, amendments. I'll be supporting Graham Simpson's Amendment 19. Thank you very much. Um, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, these uh, amendments highlight a key tension uh, about how we manage our wild and scenic areas, uh, which are so important to Scotland's identity and international image, while also uh, ensuring the sustainability of the communities that live and work there. Uh, the committee has already agreed to uh, amendments put forward by Ms Grant uh, that will require both the national planning framework and local development plans to take into account depopulation in rural areas and to support resettlement where that is appropriate. Uh, Ms Grant has spoken eloquently about the importance of supporting vibrant communities in these areas. Uh, we must be very careful, very careful uh, about projecting an urban-centric view of our landscapes onto rural areas if we want them to thrive. Um, the special protection uh, given by formal designation of wildland areas could have significant repercussions uh, for communities in these areas. Uh, it would therefore be necessary uh, to take special care uh, over the extent and the location of any designated wildland area uh, to take all of this into account. Even taking account of existing wildland maps, 
uh, it could not be assumed that the same areas of land would be designated. Wild land is already given strong protection in national planning policy, and this government recognises the value of wild land in Scotland and sought to achieve a reasonable balance in the current Scottish planning policy uh, between protecting these areas without unduly restricting rural development. However, it is clear that not everyone feels we got that balance right. Uh, work commissioned by Community Land Scotland uh, reports that communities feel locked out uh, by landscape-driven policies. Some have suggested that rather than uh, wild land, these areas should be known as clearances country. Uh, so I think we need to re revisit that debate uh, and rather than significantly further embedding our existing policy on wild land by making it a statutory designation, we need to give it very careful consideration when we come to review the national pl planning framework and Scottish planning policy. I believe policy is the right place to take this forward. Uh, allowing for all the different circumstances that apply in different areas to be properly considered. Uh, there are some significant technical difficulties uh, with this amendment. As Scottish National Her Natural Heritage clearly state, and Mr Whiteman has already touched upon, uh, identifying areas of wild land is inherited inherently subjective and I understand that the areas shown on the 2014 map are the larger and more remote areas where wildness qualities are most strongly expressed. However, SNH are also clear that what does or does not con constitute wildness depends on who is experiencing the area and even how each individual feels about that experience. And uh, Ms Ewing has articulated some of that. The to 2014 map was not developed with the intention to use it to define a formal designation. SNH have published descriptions of wildland areas which show that even within each area there are varying degrees of wildness. Given these differing views on the issue and the technical complexities involved, I feel strongly that Amendment 322 should not be supported uh, and that there should be a fuller and more open and inclusive debate on rural planning as part of the next national planning framework. Uh, this would be at risk if this bill added more weight on one side by giving wild land areas such a statutory designation. This is a sensitive issue that needs flexible solutions tailored to individual areas. That is not something legislation can easily deliver, but it is what our planning system uh, is designed to do. Uh, we do already have designated national scenic areas, which are long established, are more limited in scale than wild land. Uh, I agree with Ms Grant that it is important that communities are consulted by Scottish ministers if they are designating or changing national scenic areas. Uh, this would help to ensure that any decisions are undertaken with full and meaningful involvement of local people. However, I do not support Amendment 330 because of the automatic requirement for annual reporting it would be more reasonable to provide a report in any year in which, su in which such consultation has taken place. And I would ask Ms Grant not to press her amendment as drafted, uh, but I have no problem with the consultation requirement itself. Uh, turning to Mr Simpson's Amendment 19, uh, the words desirability in section 263A2 uh, signals that safeguarding or enhancement of the character or, of a, or appearance of a national scenic area is to be treated as a desired or sought after objective. Uh, the requirement is to pay special attention to that objective. And section 263A2 uh, is not merely creating a, a duty to consider whether or not safeguarding or enhancing of the character or appearance of a national uh, scenic area is desirable. It seems odd to remove the statutory statement that this is a desirable objective from a, from a provision intended to protect national scenic areas. 
There is no question uh, that national scenic areas already have a high level of statutory protection. And the wording proposed in Amendment 19 would not, in my view, strengthen that any further. So I do not support this amendment. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham Simpson to wind up and press a withdrawal, please. Um, yeah, I'll be uh, pressing Amendment 19. I'll be uh, uh, extremely brief because we've had a very, very good uh, debate. Um, disappointed uh, to hear the Minister uh, say that he's not in favour of uh, Amendment 19. It's a pretty technical amendment, and I, I, I do think, as I explained earlier, it would uh, beef, beef things up. Um, I don't plan to rehearse the arguments around uh, 322. We've been over that. Um, and having heard the uh, arguments around uh, Rhoda Grant's uh, Amendment 330, I'll not be supporting that. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of Amendment 19? Four. Those opposed? Three. If amendment 19 is agreed to. I call Amendment 330 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 19. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Sorry, the, the motion, the amendment was not moved. Uh, I call Amendment 322 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 19. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 322 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No, uh, Amendment 332. Yeah, right, okay. Those in favour? Zero. Those opposed? Seven. It's unanimously, uh, 322 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 335 <coughs> in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 318. Andy, will you be moving or not moving? Not moving. Thank you. I call Amendment 81 in the name of Graham Simpson in a group on its own. Graham Simpson to move and speak to Amendment 81. Thanks a lot, Convener. Um, I've spoken a, a, a lot throughout, uh, particularly this stage um, of the bill, about the need to front load the system. Um, I've spoken about how some of my amendments are a genuine attempt to do that, and this is another one. Um, the amendment would mean councils having to compile lists of locally significant buildings and inviting residents to suggest what should be on those lists. The amendment would allow local residents to nominate buildings um, for inclusion in this list and for there to be an appeal mechanism to ensure the buildings are properly protected. Now, this does stem from uh, personal experience uh, and it's what led me to conclude that we need a better system for protecting what we value. Um, I will be extremely brief in this one. Um, the, there was a, a very old, centuries old uh, pub um, near, near where I live. It doesn't matter if it was a pub or not. It was, uh, it's in uh, East Kilbride, a new town. It doesn't have many old buildings, uh, but people really valued that building. Um, and there was a proposal to uh, demolish the pub. Um, nobody wanted it to be demolished, but demolished it was because there was nothing uh, in place legally to, st to stop that. Um, and I just felt that wasn't really an acceptable uh, position. I thought we should be uh, looking for some, something better. Um, so introducing the idea of involving people, giving people the chance to say what they value I think should should please the minister who has talked throughout about wanting to get people involved in the planning system and to front load the system. There's a similar thing in England. It's not quite the same. Local heritage listing. Local lists in England play an essential role uh, in building and reinforcing a sense of local character and distinctive, distinctiveness in the historic environment. They enable the significance of any building or site on the list to be better considered in planning applications. A local list can celebrate the breadth of the historic environment of a local area by encompassing the full range of heritage assets within a community. Yes? 
Um, I, note I, I note that the Built Environment Forum Scotland observed that Amendment 81 would provide more protection for locally significant buildings than currently <coughs> exists for buildings listed under the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Area Scotland Act 1997. Um, can the member indicate which kinds of buildings he thinks uh, would make it onto this list that could not be listed under the 97 Act? Would yeah. that, for example, be a building where a famous person was born, which otherwise is devoid of architectural, particular architectural merit, for example? Uh, well, that, that, that would be a good example. Um, and and the, other, the other example is the one I gave, um, uh, which was lo local to me. Um, but basically, you're, you're, you're inviting people to say what they think should be on the list. The decision is taken by the council. So they would take the decision on what should be on that list. Would the member take a further intervention? Yes. Um, would it not be, perhaps be an alternative approach, therefore, to uh, seek to amend the, list, the existing listed buildings regime to broaden its scope? I mean, I have quite a lot of sympathy for the notion, for example, that there are fairly small but inconsequential <coughs> buildings. There's one just up, up the road here where the Treaty of Union was signed. Um, there are ones I, I know of in uh, towns around here where famous people were born uh, and people value those buildings. So would it not be an alternative to expand the grounds on which listing might take place rather, introduce, rather than introduce a new list? I think, um, I think Mr Whiteman makes, makes a, a good point. But I think when you, when you look at the uh, list of building system, most members of the public have no idea um, how, to, how to operate it. Um, they don't know, for example, that they can um, ask, request that a, bit, a building is listed. People don't know that. What I'm suggesting here is introducing a system where you do involve people, you invite people to say what they value. Um, now, having said, having said that, um, a complete ban on demolition of certain buildings would certainly require some procedural safeguards, which I accept the amendment currently lacks. Um, it could be argued that it may be more proportionate to introduce this as a discretionary power linked to the development plan yeah. rather than development management. And I'm certainly not averse to making such changes for stage three should, should the committee back the amendment uh, in its so current I'm form. Take yes. on, that, on that point. Um, so uh, I'm guessing the spirit behind um, this is there to be um, a presumption against demolition of um, such buildings, but... Does the member recognise that some of these buildings could be at risk? There could be building standard safety issues. Um, is this obviously not to be look at, looked at in, in isolation? Is the member mindful to those other considerations? Of, yeah. of, of course, of course. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, this is an amendment uh, which I accept is, n is not the finished article. Um, <coughs> but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. Um, and I think it's, um, it really meets what the, what the committee was saying uh, in stage one, is that we need to um, have more front-loading. It is about uh, involving people um, in a way that they're not uh, at the moment. Um, I accept more work that needs to be done. I'll do that work, hopefully with the minister. Um, I'd be very keen to work with the minister on this um, uh, and across parties, uh, but I will be moving it. Yeah. Final yes. brief intervention. Um, you touched on um, front loading and the involvement of communities um, in your earlier remarks. You talked about a possible um, appeal system that would sit alongside this. Yeah. Um, is it your intention that that would be an appeal that could be initiated by um, members of the community or, or community groups? Um, or are you thinking more about the the owner of of the buildings? I was thinking more of uh, more of the owner, um, because obviously if you you know you put you put somebody's building on a list, they may take a different view. So I think you know that the, 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 there needs to be we need to safeguard people who own the buildings as well, um, and that's that was the intention behind that. But you want to leave that up to ministers who has that right yeah. of appeal. Okay. Yeah. I did, is that you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister? I mean, if I could make a, a general point first before <laughs> I turn to the amendment itself. Um, 
I can only deal uh, with the words on the page in front of me. It's up to, to members to ensure that amendments they put forward do what they intend them to do. Um, there has been much talk um, in recent weeks of fixing things at stage three, uh, but the best opportunity for scrutiny of the details is now during stage two. Uh, and no one can guarantee that that will be accepted at stage three uh, and whether a necessary fix will be agreed to. Uh, and members must be aware that whatever is agreed at stage two uh, may end up on the statute book. So if the amendment does uh, not say what they intend it to achieve, I, I recommend that folk don't move these amendments. If I can turn to uh, the matter at hand, convener, the government understands uh, the value and the importance uh, that people place on the historic environment and local her heritage uh, where they live and work. And it's clear that people want a, a listing system that recognises buildings of local importance that may not qualify uh, for national listing. Uh, in a consultation by Historic Environment Scotland in 2017, 89% of respondents uh, wanted such a system in their area and 70% of those wanted to be involved in that process. Uh, Scottish planning policy already encourages decision makers uh, to consider the interest of undesignated heritage. In addition, following that in initial survey, HES have been exploring proposals for local listing as part of the review of designations policy, uh, which will be available for consultation in January. Uh, the new policy uh, will actively take into account heritage that is not nationally designated and uh, has local heritage interests. One possible option uh, could see local listing being compiled by community groups and potentially ratified by local authorities as a material consideration in planning matters. So we are working on this issue, but I don't believe this amendment is a helpful way of addressing it. Um, uh, certainly. <coughs> uh, in fact, thank you, Minister, for taking the It'd be helpful if you could confirm whether the kind of uh, propositions that might come out of the consultation you've just mentioned, um, for example, the communities creating their own list that might be material considerations, whether that would require primary legislation to implement? Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, Mr. To, to Mr. Whiteman's uh, question, it would not require um, primary legislation in that regard um, because it will be dealt with under material considerations. Uh, but I will confirm all of, uh, uh, of that in writing uh, to, to Mr. Whiteman so that he knows exactly um, what the intention uh, around about all of this is. Um, we are working on this issue, um, as I said, and I don't believe this uh, amendment is a helpful way of addressing it. Uh, firstly, I don't think it's necessary to impose a statutory duty on all planning authorities to prepare lists of locally significant buildings. This would be an, an additional financial burden for them, and as I've said, there are other possible options. Orkney Islands Council piloted a, a local listing scheme in one parish in 2011. However, they decided not to replicate this across the council area because of the costs involved and implications for staff resources. Instead, they have found that appropriate planning policies and guidance through their revised local development plan provide the protection for local heritage that is needed. So that has resolved some of the, the difficulties that Mr Whiteman has talked of. Secondly, uh, and more significantly, uh, the proposed approach to buildings included on a local list would be inconsistent with the established system of both designation and management of buildings on the national list. It would not allow locally significant buildings to be de demolished in any circumstances, but it provides no control of alterations which could completely change the character of the building. That ban on demolition uh, creates restrictions on the development of the site without any provision for consent to be obtained to allow development. Such a blanket restriction on development, which has no scope to consider individual cases, would almost certainly be viewed as a disproportionate and unjustified interference with the property rights of the owner. 
and the restriction on development would be much greater than for listed buildings or buildings in a conservation area. Uh, the existing controls on works to listed buildings, including demolition, enable planning authorities to consider all of the relevant circumstances at the time. Uh, they must have special regard to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting or any features of special architectural or historic interest, but they can also take into account the wider public benefits. While developers generally try hard to uh, conserve historic features, it may occasionally be necessary to demolish a historic structure to uh, enable wider redevelopment. For example, an old bridge may have to be removed to allow for flood defence works or because it has become uh, dangerous to public safety. <laughs> Any protection for locally significant buildings should surely allow for a similar system of consent for necessary works. I would ask Mr Simpson uh, to withdraw this amendment and to allow Historic Environment Scotland to take forward its consultation on approaches to recognition of locally important heritage. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Graham Simpson to wind up and press of withdraw. Um, thanks, thanks, Convener. Um, so based on what uh, the Minister said, it, that this comes out of the uh, uh, we, are, we are working on it uh, file, um, which I, it also used um, when we were discussing land value capture. Um, everything he said suggests that he uh, actually agrees um, with, with the idea. Um, so if he does agree, um, I can't see why um, he would be so negative uh, around around this uh, particular amendment. Well, well, so intervention. Yes. Um, I am um, again the amendment for the simple reason um, that again we have unintended consequences uh, around about the amendment that uh, uh, as it's drafted <coughs> and it's worded um, at this moment in time. Um, and I would reiterate the point that the amendment as it stands would not allow locally significant buildings to be demolished in any circumstances. Um, that cannot be right for many, many reasons, including the reasons that Ms Lennon pointed out around about danger. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the ministers are basically saying, leave it to us, don't put this in uh, legislation, we'll, we'll, we'll sort this out. Um, it, won't e it, won't, it won't even be uh, uh, included in any, any legislation. Um, Parliament has an opportunity here to do, do the right thing uh, and to deliver what the minister says he wants. But could, would the member take a brief intervention? Yeah. I hear what the member says, but I mean, if the amendment is, it seems to have been conceded that the amendment, you know, in terms of its current drafting, sorry, um, perhaps needs further work, why are we being asked to vote on something that, you know, isn't going to work? I just don't get that. I mean, if the member wishes to do something at stage three, that's entirely up to the member. But if this is seen as unworkable, why are we being asked to, to vote on it? Well, the minister doesn't even want it at stage three. So I I, I will be pressing this. Um, this is it's not unusual. We've had a number of amendments throughout stage two, which members have accepted uh, are not the finished article. Uh, they have uh, pledged to go away and work on them for stage three. This falls into that category, but I do think it's a good idea, uh, and I'm keen to see what the mood of the committee is, so I will be. A further intervention, apologies for my uh, voice today, I, I promised I wouldn't speak very much, but um, I think this does raise some interesting questions, and one of Graeme Simpson's intentions behind the motion appears to be to encourage participation locally. You've talked about front-loading and that important community engagement. I'm, I'm a bit nervous about um, your um, intention to bring in a right to appeal, but you're kind of a leading the community on a little bit. And then if a planning authority says, no, this building isn't locally significant enough, there's no right of appeal for that community. Now, you said that you've got an ace card up your sleeve for stage three on equalising the appeal system. Um, I would just thought that you might have brought some of that thinking to this amendment um, before asking us to vote today. Mr Daniels, Paul Daniels, would you like to tell us about this? <laughs> there's, uh, you claim to be a magician. <laughs> there's, there's no ace card today, uh, Katrina, <coughs> and I shall wrap it up there. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and are you pressing on with drawing, sir? Uh, I will press it. Thank you. <coughs> the question is that Amendment 81 be agreed to. <coughs> are we all agreed? No. no. Those in favour of Amendment 81? Two. Those opposed? <coughs> Five. Uh, therefore, <coughs> Amendment 81 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with Amendment 91. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 90 and speak to both amendments in the group. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, Convener. Uh, these two amendments, 90 and 91, deal with uh, trees, tree preservation orders and conservation areas. Uh, evidence was given to the committee at stage one by the tree officers group, we are a group of professionals. Um, who work in local <coughs> authorities um, on matters to do with trees and their governance. Um, we made recommendations that the Minister um, should consider these um, observations that were made to us, um, but in the Minister's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, he indicated that he would not be doing any further work um, on this. As so, as a result, I took it upon myself to engage with tree officers groups over the summer to ascertain what their um, concerns were. It appeared to me um, that their concerns were fell into two uh, groups, which reflects the amendments. The first was that um, if tree preservation orders themselves do not, if they are silent on the question uh, in the actual order of an individual tree, then potentially permitted development orders can override <laughs> Uh, TPOs, and they were of the view that this should not happen. The second concern related to trees in conservation areas, <coughs> where, as I understand it, if any works um, are to be done um, on a tree or any works, any proposal comes forward in a conservation area that would affect uh, a tree, the only means by which a planning authority can currently effectively protect that tree or refuse the consent is by... Um, notifying a tree preservation order, which is a complicated thing to do within short timescales. Um, I move Amendment 90, but I do intend to seek leave to withdraw it and will not be pressing uh, Amendment 91. This is following discussions with the Minister's officials in which we've shared our perspectives on what is the mischief <laughs> that is uh, sought to be addressed here. And I think we're kind of agreed that this mischief is not... Um, well identified yet, but there is, I think, an agreement, and I'd be grateful for the Minister's confirmation here, um, that there remains a concern, potentially, and I would be keen that uh, the Minister and his officials have a robust conversation with the tree officers group um, to ensure that if they do have legitimate concerns, about the operation of the tree preservation order system or trees in conservation areas, that remedies can be introduced um, to uh, the bill. I, I took the view when this evidence came forward that we have a planning bill every 10 years or so and that if there is any tidying up to be done in the planning system, then obviously a piece of primary legislation is the place to do that. And in discussion with the minister and his officials, um, I think, as one committee might recollect, amendments 19 and 20 um, were uh, areas of the planning system that were deemed to be in need of some tidying up. So I would be grateful if the Minister could confirm that he's willing to have those discussions with that sector and uh, confirm to me that if there are any areas that could be doing with some tidying up or uh, easing the work that is necessary in order to make uh, properly protect trees that planning authorities think should be protected in conservation areas, <coughs> that he in fact uh, does that. I'll leave that there. Thank, thank you very convener. much, Andy. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I, can I begin by confirming to Mr Whiteman that officials will continue to talk to the tree officers group? Um, they may have a case, but um, as it stands, there is insufficient evidence uh, about the impact of the changes proposed. Um, convener, if I, I realise that Mr Whiteman is not going to press these amendments, um, but I think it might be helpful 
um, if I uh, put into context some of the discussions that have been going on uh, around about this and where um, the, the legislation uh, currently lies. Uh, can I begin by saying that I think everyone agrees that um, trees play an important path, part in both the quality um, of uh, uh, our urban and rural environments. Uh, and that is why there are already a range of measures uh, in place uh, and legislative duties in place uh, to ensure both the preservation and planting of trees and so that our trees and woodlands continue to be protected. Uh, and Scottish planning policy has a strong presumption against uh, removal of any woodland and any uh, approval for woodland re removal should be conditional on achieving significant uh, net public benefits. The two amendments uh, relate to trees situated uh, within a conservation area and tree pr preservation orders or TPOs. Uh, which are well established, a well-established mechanism in the planning uh, system. Uh, TPOs can be used by planning authorities to protect trees and groups of trees considered important, important for amenity, uh, cultural or historic significance. Uh, a TPO made by the planning authority under section 160 of the 1997 Act may prohibit works being carried out to trees without consent from the planning authority. In addition, if a tree is in a conservation area uh, but is not protected by a TPO, then it is given a, a level of protection under section 172 of the 1997 Act. In terms of section 172, it is an offence to carry out certain works such as uprooting, felling or lopping to such a tree without first notifying, notifying the planning authority and so giving them an opportunity to prote protect the tree by making a TPO. Uh, and they must do that within six weeks of the notification, otherwise the works uh, can go ahead. A grant of planning permission, uh, whether granted through permitted development or through a planning application being approved, does not itself remove the protections provided to trees by a TPO or in a conservation area under Section 172 of the 1997 Act. However, a TPO may itself include exemptions from the prohibition on works without consent, which it creates. Uh, and Scottish Government guidance recommends that this should be uh, this should include limited exemptions uh, for works which uh, enjoy permitted development rights, and this allows the likes of SEPA and utilities companies to carry out necessary work necessary works without requiring separate consent for anything that affects trees. Uh, with Amendment 90 uh, and the first part of Amendment 91, I understand that Mr. Whiteman was trying to limit or remove those exemptions from per for permitted development rights. Uh, and I, I don't support that intention because it could uh, restrict or delay the ability of stat statutory undertakers uh, to carry out necessary works to provide and maintain in infrastructure, uh, for example, and it would create additional burdens for planning authorities for work that in the vast majority of cases would be approved. But in fact, that is not what the amendments would have done. Um, and bear with me, convener, because this gets quite technical, but I think uh, the committee uh, deserves to, to, to hear um, these things. Section 166 of the 1997 Act uh, allows for the cutting down, topping and lopping of a tree, notwithstanding that it is protected by a TPO in certain circumstances. Those circumstances include under paragraph BA of subsection 6, where the work is authorised by an order granting development consent. Section 1606 does not authorise any works to a tree. It just prevents a TPO from prohibiting certain works to a tree in the specified circumstances. Subsection 1A of Section 172 of the 1997 Act similar, similarly disapplies the requirement for notification of work to, or, to trees in a conservation area if the work is authorised by an order granting development consent. Uh, Mr Whiteman's amendments uh, stated that nothing in these subsections is to be taken 
as permitting development, uh, development order under Section 30 to authorise the uprooting, felling or lopping of trees. But those subsections do not refer to orders under Section 30 of the 1997 Act, uh, which grant planning permission, development consent, as defined in Section 277 of the 1997 Act, relates to consent under the Planning Act 2008, which is UK legislation. In terms of Section 31 of the Act, development consent is required for development that is or forms part of a nationally significant infrastructure project. These are almost all large-scale projects located in England and Wales, and the only case where it would not would be required in Scotland would be for certain cross-country oil or gas pipelines where one end is in England or Wales and the other end is in Scotland. So nothing in the sections mentioned in Amendments 90 and 91 would, uh, uh, would permit a development under Section 30 to override the existing protections in any case. Um, uh, I know that this is not the easiest uh, part of the legislation uh, to follow, um, and I would like to thank Mr Whiteman for taking the time to discuss these amendments with officials, um, and I'm glad that he has agreed that uh, he, he will not uh, move them. Uh, and uh, I think, convener, I may well just leave it at that, because we go into a huge amount more technicality, but I've given the committee um, a, 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 an insight into how complex all of this is um, and the unintended consequences. I'm very pleased um, that Mr. Whiteman has spoken to officials. We will continue to speak um, with the tree officers group and we'll continue to update Mr. Whiteman around about um, those conversations. Uh, and with that, convener, uh, I will uh, keep stream now. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Andy Whiteman to wind up. Or, and press of withdrawal. I thank you very much, uh, Convener. I thank the Minister for putting on record um, some of that during discussions on this. I did encounter the 2008 Act, uh, the UK Statute on National Infrastructure, and I would just put on, put on the record that it appeared to me that some planning authorities were interpreting uh, the consequential provisions of the 2008 Act um, as they come in, as they were inserted into the 97 Act, incorrectly. Um, Mr Whiteman will uh, take an intervention. Uh, if Mr Whiteman uh, wants to pass on those authorities where he thinks that um, they are interpreting uh, the legislation incorrectly, um, we will have a, a look at that and we'll talk to and write to the, the authorities concerned. Um, and uh, to go a bit further than that, um, you know, if we find out that this is a, a widespread scenario, I'm more than willing to write to all authorities um, to, to clarify or get the chief planner to do so. I thank the minister for that. I'm not sure I intend to tell tales out of school. The, um, some of this information I deduce from conversations I, 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 I had. But I think the minister gets the point um, that there is potentially some, A, some confusion in this area, and B, potentially some clarification and tidying up that needs to be done to ensure that the important work of protecting trees, particularly in conservation areas, could be more effectively um, administered. Um, I w am I withdrawing or not moving 90? I think I'm seeking leave to withdraw it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy Whiteman wishes to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. I call Amendment 91 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 90. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 152 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst, grouped with Amendments 182. Gordon Lindhurst to move Amendment 152 and speak to both amendments in the group and welcome Gordon. Thank you, thank you very much, Convener. Um, just to set out very briefly, the, the purpose of Amendment 152 is simply to stop a gap in the current legislative scheme. That gap means that neighbour notification of, uh, for consent is required if a building is, li uh, is not listed, but is not required if a building is listed. Um, this is not only counterintuitive, but it places listed buildings on a less protected level than non-listed buildings. 
and this in turn can affect not just owners of buildings but tenants and residents of such buildings. Uh, Neighbours in listed buildings are often only aware that works are to be carried out and that listed building consent has been granted when workmen arrive and start carrying out works such as forming openings in walls which may have structural implications in a building, installing additional bathroom facilities which can affect drainage or altering communal spaces which can affect things as serious as fire safety. So all that this amendment does is seek to remove the anomaly that means that neighbour notification requirements are not required for listed buildings and it simply makes the requirement the same for both listed and unlisted buildings. Um, the amendment has the support of Edinburgh World Heritage, the Coburn Association and the Built Environment Forum Scotland. Um, I should say in the interest of transparency that uh, I am an owner of a flat in a listed building in Edinburgh. Um, I would move the amendment 152. I'm happy to take any questions from committee members. Um, okay, thank you. You'll get the chance. Maybe people will want to ask when they're winding up. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to amendment 182 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I support Gordon Lutter's <laughs> amendment uh, 152. My, uh, my amendment 182 um, was lodged with the intention of sending a signal to the owners of listed buildings who are doing nothing um, with them, but apparently waiting for the day the building becomes too dangerous and has to be demolished. It seeks to send a signal within the planning system uh, and make clear that there's a presumption against the use of that building for any other purpose other than that would affect um, the reason for uh, the listing. Now, I'm aware that um, this is a very potentially blunt tool, and I'm also aware that presumptions against, or need presumptions for, are things that this committee has not been persuaded make good law uh, in planning. I'm also aware that uh, much of this, um, the intention of, of my amendment here would be uh, better secured under property law uh, reform. Uh, when I read this amendment, and it's been several months since this was drafted, um, I came to the conclusion that I'm not persuaded by my own amendment um, it has some flaws in logic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, good, it's good to come fresh to these things. Um, and I, I, um, I will not be moving it when invited. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Can I congratulate the, the member on his honesty? Uh, does anybody else have any contribution? In that case, Minister. Uh, convener. Uh, amendment 152 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst would lead to significant duplication uh, for both planning authorities and the neighbours of buildings subject to listed building applications. Uh, the current position is that applications for listed building consent have to be advertised by a notice on or near the building uh, and notice is published in a local newspaper and the Edinburgh Gazette. Where, exter where external works are considered, uh, development that affect the character or appearance of the building, a separate planning application is required, and this triggers direct notification to neighbouring premises. In both case cases, the notice must allow at least 21 days for representations to be made. This amendment would mean that in many cases where external works are proposed to a listed building, neighbours would receive two notifications uh, and quite possibly would feel the need to make two representations. Uh, they would also receive notifications for internal works, uh, such as the fitting of a new kitchen or redecoration, uh, which are unlikely to have any impact on neighbours. Um, very briefly. Thank you, Minister. Um, it, does the Minister accept that when the planning authority is taking um, matters into account, they can only take into account representations on the application in front of them? So if someone's made representations to a separate application, for example, a planning application, um, would, would that not be a matter for that application alone? And in terms of material considerations for the listed building consent, would they not have to look at the submissions in front of them to that 
application. What we have here <clears throat> is a situation of duplication, and I'll, I'll come back to, to, to some of these points uh, in a little while. Uh, duplication, which adds to the bureaucracy, um, when um, I, I think that most of us have agreed that we actually want to streamline the system and get rid of bureaucracy. And beyond that, I find it, um, if you wait a second, um, I find it um, uh, rather bizarre, you know, um, that uh, you have to uh, notify your neighbours if you want to redecorate or put in a new kitchen. Um, you know, uh, that may be fine for those folks that want to keep up with the, the Joneses um, and find out what everybody's doing. But I don't think that that's uh, necessar necessarily um, a, a, re a requirement. Mr. Linter, I'll take convener. Um, the, the minister talks of duplication, uh, but if something is simply advertised in the press, um, who spends their whole evening reading notifications in the press every day or week of the year to make sure their neighbour's not submitting an application? Um, I don't think that's a, a valid comment on this. Internal alterations... A chance to sum up, Mr. Lund. Yeah, you will have Sorry, a chance well, to sum just, up. Forgive, just forgive my lack of knowledge of the very complicated procedures that apply in this parliament. Oh, um, they're all written down for me. <laughs> convener, um, uh, no fees are charged um, for listed building consent, uh, so this would also be a st substantial uh, additional burden for planning authorities with no income to support it. Um, and representation on listed building application uh, is likely to be on the same grounds as on the planning ap application, um, uh, and uh, as most folk would be unlikely to understand the difference. Uh, the notification and advertisement requirements are set out in regulations. Uh, Mr Lindhurst um, has tried to import uh, wording from the planning regulations into the primary legislation on listed buildings. Uh, and there are some technical problems with that. I am happy uh, to consider whether there are any significant gaps in the current ar uh, arrangements and to amend uh, the regulations if necessary. But this amendment as it stands goes much too far um, and I really cannot support it. Thank you, Minister. Um, Gordon Lindhurst to wind up and press or withdraw the amendment. Um, well, the, the, the Minister's comments uh, are not persuasive uh, in my submission. Um, the reason that they do not assist proprietors in a block, for example, internal alterations can be major. They can affect other properties within a block, for example, in a listed building installation of a new bathroom in a flat above the flat below. Um, the, the flooding possibilities that arise out of such things, alterations of... Um, um, alterations, well, I, I think the Minister has had his say, and I... Um, well, I'll allow him to intervene briefly, perhaps. Um, I, I, thank you. It's not just uh, a newspaper advert, as Mr Lindhurst well knows. Um, the listed building applica application uh, requires uh, um, a, a notice to be displayed in the building as well. So it's not just newspaper advertising, it is a notice that has to be displayed. Well, I, I think as the, the Minister well knows, such advertisements are not always displayed prominently in a place where a proprietor of a building will see it. And indeed, a proprietor may wish to have notification but have um, a flat let out on a long-term to a long-term tenant, for example. The tenant may not uh, see the significance of a notice that happens to be placed on a street railing some distance from the flat they uh, live in. So I think Internal alterations can be very significant, fire safety implications, other matters that I've, I've touched on, and uh, that is something that a proprietor is, is not notified of, and in, in an individual sense, in a way that a proprietor will realise what is going on and um, take notice of it. So I, I, do, uh, I do press... No, I, I won't at this stage, Minister. Uh, I do press the amendment. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, for the question is that Amendment 152 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 152? Four. Those opposed? Three. 152 is therefore agreed to. Okay. I call Amendment 182 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 152, and Andy Whiteman to move or not move? That's the one that doesn't persuade you, Andy. 
This is the one that doesn't persuade me. All right. Yeah, no. Not, not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 231 in the name of Rhoda Grant and a group on its own. Rhoda Grant, move and speak to Amendment 231. Um, I move Amendment um, 231, um, which makes provision for compulsory acquisition of land that has been identified for the resettling of previously inhabited settlements in local <coughs> development plans. I've spoken in previous meetings about the need to repopulate many rural areas, and I won't rehearse these arguments now. Um, it therefore, for this amendment therefore provides a means to reset our land as identified in such plans and for that purpose. Um, this is a useful backstop power for furthering resettlement of land and of course uh, any such power of compulsory purchase can't be used unless as a final, unless as a final step in the sale of land is otherwise not going to happen. In this case it could only be used if that land had been allocated in the local development plan and had therefore been subject to public consultation, scrutiny and decision by the local authority. Without such ultimate powers, the cause of repopulation might be thwarted by powerful private interests. It's a useful power to have available. Having such powers focuses minds, but hopefully these powers will never be needed or used. But it does mean that that does not mean that they should not exist, providing leverage to serve the public interest. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've previous, previously set out my thoughts on Rhoda Grant's amendments on rural resettlement, and I agree with the aim of addressing depopulation of re rural areas, and that, in principle, uh, resettling previously populated populated areas uh, could help to uh, achieve this. In earlier sessions, the committee has already supported amendments from Rhoda Grant and from Alistair Allen on this subject. Um, and as a result, uh, the desirability of increasing the population of rural areas and of allocating land for resettlement will need to be considered in the national planning framework and local development plans respectively. However, I cannot support Amendment 231 in Ms Grant's name uh, because it is unnecessary. Uh, local authorities already have the power under Section 189 of the 1997 Act uh, to compulsory acquire <coughs> land by CPO in order to secure development or redevelopment where this is identified in a development plan or where the land is required for a purpose which it is necessary to achieve in the interests of proper planning in the area. Uh, if uh, an authority uh, includes policies and allocates suitable locations uh, for resettlement and local development plans uh, and needs to compulsory purchase the land to deliver that, the authority already has a mechanism for doing so under section 189 as it stands. So I would ask uh, Ms Grant to withdraw her amendment. Thank you. Uh, Rhoda Grant to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, I... Given the, the Minister's comments, I will um, not press the motion at this time. I will go and um, review what he has said and see if it adequately fulfils the purpose of my amendment. Thank you very much for that. Um, Rhoda Grant wishes to withdraw her amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. I call Amendment 336 in the name of Claudia Beamish, grouped with Amendments 337, 338 and 339. Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 336 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and I move um, Amendment 336. The new planning, planning bill presents a logical opportunity to simplify, in my view, the processes on mineral working sites in Scotland, aligning planning with other areas of government policy. My amendments in this group cover mineral working sites and their and more specifically, peatland extraction sites. Amendment 336, though it looks technical, is, I, I think, a simple amendment, which adds nature conservation as a recognised after, after use for mineral working sites. Currently, Schedule 3 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 97, 1997, sets out three potential uses for land after being restored following mineral extraction. Use for agriculture, forestry or amenity. This list fails to recognise nature conservation as a highly valuable option for former extraction sites. 
This could be the restoration of peatland habitats for carbon storage or the enhancement of biodiversity and other ecosystem services. The amendment stipulates <coughs> that where nature conservation is, cho is the chosen aftercare use, it must meet the standard set by SNH. For a number of mineral extraction sites, this could be the most appropriate and locally desirable after use, and is sometimes supported by communities as well, and a standard to which developers should be required to adhere to. It could transform a scarred landscape to an important space for communities and nature. I'll move to my next amendment. 337 looks to tackle instances where mineral extraction sites are left dormant for a number of years and to rebalance the responsibility to, op uh, to operators rather than planning authorities. Existing legislation, Schedule 8, Old Mineral Workings and Permissions of the Town and Country Planning Act 1997, empowers a planning authority to assume that a minerals extraction site has permanently ceased working when it has been dormant for two years, and to therefore require the removal of machinery and the restoration of the site. However, the onus is wholly on the planning authorities to monitor whether sites are sitting dormant and for how long. It also does not prevent operators from leaving sites dormant for years, then revisiting operations without input from planning authorities. A, a 2009 report from DEFRA shows a huge lack of information for most sites, uh, and that includes in Scotland. More than half the sites listed have unknown status. This amendment would mean that there, the operator, if the operator had left a site dormant and ceased operations for two years on a continuous basis or more, their planning permission is automatically suspended. Operators would then be required to proactively apply to the planning authority for permission to resume operations. And I do think in view of the fact that planning officers are often really up against it in monitoring um, open cast and, uh, and peatland dormant sites, that, that there's that perspective as well in terms of cost to local authorities. Member will, members will know how these dormant and unrestored sites are applied to communities and landscapes across Scotland. Um, Ockham Course is an example of this. This could put some onus on the operator to keep their permissions up to date and better enable planning authorities to become aware of dormant sites um, which might benefit from some enhanced scrutiny. Uh, 338, the next amendments, uh, that and 339, look at bettering the processes surrounding the protection of peatlands. And I note that uh, there is now, I saw in the, um, in, in the press this morning, that there is a move to have the flow country uh, designated as, um, as a, world, um, a world heritage site, a UNESCO site, such as New Lanark is and other places um, like the Grand Canyon. So it shows its importance for, um, for tourism. I just make that point as well. Um, so uh, around uh, 0 0.5 million cubic metres of peat are still being extracted annually in Scotland removing a carbon store that takes thousands of years to form, as we know, resulting in the loss of almost all biodiversity value on the site and changes to hydrology that can have a negative effect on flood management. With increasing global recognition of the need for carbon reductions from land use activity and to meet our climate change targets, it is clear that action is required to address the numerous old planning permissions for peat extraction. Current uh, permissions periods are lengthy and poorly regulated, in my view, with cases of lapsed permissions where peat has continued to be extracted for years post expiry, such as Moy Moss in the Highlands, where peat is, um, has been extracted 13, uh, 13 years after the um, expiry of, of uh, permissions. So Amendment 338 introduces a sunset clause uh, for all old peat extraction consent, setting a deadline for companies to reactivate permissions or see them permanently expired. This would mean that all companies with consents on phase one or two lists, which I'm happy to explain but won't go into details unless members wish me to, would need to reactivate the consents in the two-year period after the, uh, the planning bill receives royal consent. The Environment Act 1995 introduced a requirement for the periodic review of mineral uh, permissions. However, only 15 sites are known to have gone through this review process through, <coughs> through the statutory arrangements. And these requirements, I understand, are not enforced. Opportunities for inactive permissions to cease through the process are, are not being realised, uh, and there is no centrally available information of any sites uh, at this stage where planning permission has ceased to have effect. 
These old planning permissions <coughs> also act as a barrier, in my view, to obtaining funding for restoration through uh, mechanisms such as peatland action. A sunset clause would remove long-term uncertainty for the status of carbon in the peat soils and remove the burden on local authorities to instigate the process, overcoming issues of lack of enforcement and clear data. Importantly, the amendment stipulates that the restoration and aftercare conditions would still apply. I do not believe this amendment uh, runs the risk of encouraging developers uh, to start production at unwanted peatland sites with old permissions, as it simply requires companies to reactivate consents in order to work at some future date, rather than requiring work to be started. And finally, convener, my amendment 339 clarifies that any calculation of compensation for restriction of working rights for peatland extraction should take UK and Scottish Government policy on peat use into account. The Scottish Government supports the UK's targets for retail soil supplies to be peat-free by 2020 and for commercial horticulture to end peat use by 2030. The Scottish Government has also set a target to restore, restore 250,000 hectares of peatland by 2030. Uh, while many of, of those on the committee, and indeed on my committee, are aware of these issues, uh, it is important to highlight this because this amendment ensures compensation calculations are based on market assumptions. And the Scottish Government has rightly given high priority to the phasing out of peat use, peat extraction, in recognition of significant climate change impacts and adverse effects to water, biodiversity and wildlife from damaged peatlands. However, Despite the increased understanding of the importance of peatlands and policies to phase out the use of peat in horticulture with clear target dates, Scotland is still being cons uh, peat extraction in Scotland is, I understand, still being consented with extraction allowed up into the 2040s. Although planning policy has a presumption against new commercial peat extraction permissions, the Section 8, sorry, Schedule 8 of the existing Planning Act <coughs> allows planning authorities to order the discontinuance of mineral extraction if it is in the interests of their districts. Any such order could trigger a claim for compensation by the holder of the extraction rights, as provided for in Schedule 10 of the Act. Last year, Ocken Koch Moss was re-granted re planning permission despite environmental concerns and approaches from my constituents, not that that would necessarily make a great deal of difference, but, but, but I, I was aware of that issue then. Uh, and Midlothian Council's hands were tied by its ability to pay um, the, the loss income compensation. This amendment, uh, to, to um, finally make the point, could give confidence to planning authorities to consider restricting working rights in strategically important areas of peatland restoration. <coughs> and it would provide more clarity for the scope of possible compensation claims. At this stage, this one is a, plan, is, is a probing amendment. Um, if there is an appetite for the amendment, I recognise there are some details to be further considered, such as possibly defini definitions of retail and also of commercial sectors. However, I hope, amendments can, I hope that members can support it um, in the longer term as it shows the changes in clear public interest in ensuring peatlands are safeguarded and to provide a realistic basis for compensation claims without under, uh, undermining human rights principles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister. Uh, convener, I'll start with uh, Amendment 336. Um, I uh, agree that it would be useful for nature conservation to be one of the uses that can be specified in aftercare conditions. However, the proposal that the standard should be determined by Scottish natural heritage rather than by the planning authority uh, does not work uh, nor sit well uh, alongside the standards required for other uses. Uh, an aftercare condition is imposed by the planning authority uh, and may require the steps to be taken to be set out in a scheme to be approved by the planning authority. Amendment 336. And yes, very briefly. Um, uh, if I was to consider um, the possibility of not moving the amendment today, but uh, looking at that aspect of it, uh, and, and possibly an alteration to reflect uh, the point that the minister has made about about SNH and put put SNH in possibly in a more advisory role. Would that 
uh, makes sense. Um, I, 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 will, I will come to points at the end. As, uh, as Ms Beamish is uh, very well aware, um, I'm happy that she continues discussions with uh, me and officials around about some of these matters. I'll clarify all of these points at the end. So. Right, thank you. Um, uh, so Amendment 336 in effect provides that, uh, that what the planning authority may approve is to be determined by SNH and it elevates the role of SNH to uh, decision maker rather than an advisor. So that's why I, I would not support the aim of including nature con conservation in aftercare conditions. Um, and I would ask uh, Ms Beamish to, to withdraw uh, that amendment today. On the other amendments in this group, I recognise that there are particular issues around about peat extraction and the legislation relating to old mineral permissions uh, approved prior to 1982. Uh, the policies and context uh, in relation to peat have changed uh, very significantly uh, since that date. So it seems entirely reasonable uh, to reconsider the circumstances uh, that allow dormant or inactive peat sites to be brought back into operation. However, I cannot support the amendments in their current form, um, in particular amendments 336 and 337 are not restricted to peat but cover all types of mineral extraction. Uh, and this could have a significant impact on other industries including, including aggregate extraction. Uh, Amendment 337 would automatically suspend all minerals consents if there has been no activity on the site for two years. There are already powers for planning authorities to take action where works have permanently ceased. These existing powers include procedures, for example, notification requirements and powers to require steps to be taken for environmental protection, which are not provided for in this amendment. Amendment 338 uh, would require all permissions granted. Um, yeah, I'll take Mr. Simpson. Can you? It's really just um, for, for for clarity. Um, is is it the period of two years that the minister objects to, or or, or is he minded to accept a, a different period, or, or is he just against? imposing any period at all? I, I, my problem is around about mineral consents. I, I think, you know, we can have a uh, discussion around about timescale, um, but, you know, it is putting peat and mineral consents together, um, which Miss uh, Beamish's uh, amendment does. Um, amendment 338 would require um, all the permissions uh, before 1982 for both dormant and active sites to expire two years from the Act receiving uh, royal assent. Again, this would apply to all sites and not just those where peat extraction is taking place. Under the requirements for the review of old mineral permissions in Schedule 9 of the 1997 Act, those sites would have had new conditions imposed in the early 2000s and then require review every 15 years. So most of them should have had reviews quite recently and will have up-to-date conditions in place. And I see no reason why those permissions should be automatically revoked. These amendments do not reflect the operational needs of the quarrying industry uh, and will impact on their ability to ensure that an adequate and steady supply of material is available uh, to meet the needs of the construction industry. Uh, that will also make it difficult for local authorities to plan for a 10-year land bank of construction aggregates as required by Scottish planning policy. Even if the proposals were to be restricted to peat sites, I would want to ensure that they are compatible with the various powers already contained in the 1997 Act. This is a very complex part of the existing legislation and there are a number of technical problems with the drafting of the amendments that are not easy to resolve. For example, I recognise that Amendment 339 seeks to re reduce compensation for withdrawing consent for peat extraction, peat extraction relating to the voluntary target set by the UK government for ending the use of horticultural peat. 
Given the strong environmental case, I believe there could be justification for this. However, some further work would be needed on the definitions and also to make sure this provision on compensation links to any provision on the suspension and expiry of permissions. It does not currently connect properly with Amendments 337 and 338. To conclude, Convener, I understand uh, the reasoning behind these um, uh, amendments in relation to peat. Um, I cannot accept the extension to other minerals and the impact that this would have on the construction industry. And there are also technical issues with the amendments as they stand. I would be happy uh, to continue working uh, with Ms Beamish uh, to see if we can bring forward adjusted proposals for stage three of the bill, but I would ask her not to press these amendments in the meantime. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Minister Claudia Beamish to wind up and press or withdraw. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. And um, I've listened carefully to the minister's comments. Um, in terms of 336, I do not intend to press that amendment today. And uh, I think in terms of the relationship between planning authorities and SNH, um, uh, an important point has been made, um, which has occurred in relation to other um, amendments, one of which was mine, uh, in relation to... Um, their advisory role, and so I think I would um, not press that, uh, not move that today, rather. Um, in terms of 337 and 338, uh, I, I was aware that it extended, be, that both extended beyond peat extraction, and I'm very happy to have discussion on that. Um, there are also <coughs> open car sites which um, have been affected by, by the, the points made in my amendment. Uh, but it may be um, that it's more appropriate to focus only on peat. Um, although I am disappointed um, that the minister hasn't recognized the importance of the circular economy in relation to the gaining of aggregates. And, and then I realized that that is then going to go back into present uh, mineral extraction um, planning arrangement. So I do, I acknowledge it's complicated, uh, and, and I will consider removing, um, well, firming up those amendments in relation to peat only, because that was the principal um, reason for those amendments. Um, and on 339, um, I think in, I, I won't move that amendment either today, um, because of the offer of the minister to discuss the discuss the very complex issues around compensation and uh, I'm happy uh, to have those meetings. Thank you. Okay, can I, just for the record, can I ask, are you, are you pressing or withdrawing Amendment 336? I'm, I'm withdrawing it. Thank you. Sorry, I, I have moved it already, haven't I? So I have to withdraw it. That's okay, uh, right. thanks. Uh, Claudia Beamish wishes to withdraw our amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? No. Thank you. I call Amendment 337 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 336. Claudia Beamish to officially move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 338 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 336. <coughs> Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 339 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 336. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, I think this is an appropriate time to take a short break. Uh, to suspend the meeting for a few minutes. Thank you.
I call Amendment 308 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Adam Tomp Tompkins to move Amendment 308 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's good to be back. I move Amendment 308 um, in my name. Um, so, uh, Part 5 of the Bill is concerned with the infrastructure levy, which is what these amendments are concerned with. And I think, um, Convener, we're probably all agreed right across the political spectrum that you know, we understand that the importance of effective infrastructure to effective development. And we also all surely know from our own constituencies or regions um, uh, uh, stories, illustrations of um, inadequate infrastructure being a stymie on effective development, and that is plainly not in the national economic interest. We also uh, all know that there is a statutory device to deal with this, the Section 75 orders. Um, under the Town and Country Planning Act, but those, um, that scheme is narrow um, and has been narrowed further by the um, recent judgment of the UK Supreme Court uh, in the case from Aberdeenshire. I imply no criticism of the UK Supreme Court, um, but there, clearly what was happening under the Section 75 scheme was that a number of local authorities, including Aberdeenshire, were seeking to extend the reach of Section 75 orders beyond that which was um, lawfully mandated in that, in that act, hence the need at least to think about whether we need to supplement the existing Section 75 orders scheme um, with a broader um, infrastructure, le in infrastructure levy as um, they now have uh, south of the border in England and Wales. And I welcome the fact that the government is thinking along these lines. Um, I encourage the government to think a little bit harder and a little bit faster um, along these lines. And that's what my amendments 308 and 309 are designed to do, convener. They are um, probing amendments. I don't intend to press them uh, today, but I did want to um, uh, start this debate on infrastructure levy in order to, uh, I suppose, really test um, the government's resolve uh, on this issue and to encourage gently the, the government to, um, um, uh, to move more quickly um, and to move with greater fervour in the direction um, of understanding the importance of um, infrastructure to um, development. Uh, because as this committee pointed out in its stage one report uh, on the planning bill, um, when the bill was uh, published in December uh, last year, the government said that no decisions have yet been made on the use of the power contained in section 27 of the bill to which amendments 308 and 309 um, uh, relate. So we are nearly, well, we are 11 months on. Uh, a year ago, it was the case that no decisions have yet been made on the use of this power. So my first question uh, for the minister, I hope he'll be able to respond to this when he responds in a few moments, is whether any decisions have yet been made um, on, on the use of this power, and if not, um, why not? Um, we all know that there will, if there is to be an infrastructure levy in Scotland, some, some, something quite, you know, quite clear and precise will have to be said about what the relationship is between that infrastructure levy and the existing, ex existing Section 75 obligations. There is no detail in the bill. There's no detail in the accompanying policy memorandum. There's no detail um, uh, in any of the documentation that the government put forward when it published the bill in December. Is the detail available now? If not, why not? And if it isn't available now, when will it be available? And can we please have it before stage three? Uh, this committee also noted um, that the um, policy memorandum accompanying the bill notes that further work is required to define a model which is practical and meets the objectives set out for the infrastructure levy. Well, I, I agree with that, um, but we've had a year. Um, has further work been undertaken to define a model which is practical and which meets the objectives and if it, that work has been undertaken can we please see it and if it hasn't been undertaken why not um, that would indicate that the government isn't really serious about infrastructure levy and that work should be undertaken it should be undertaken before stage three and shared with us before stage uh, three and the committee finally noted uh, convener um, that a number of the witnesses that this committee heard from in its stage one inquiry were what the committee rather nicely describes as generally lukewarm about the proposals for an infrastructure uh, levy. Um, uh, that's the kind of um, uh, language of fudge, which is beloved of all politicians seeking consensus, um, uh, uh, perhaps apt for today. Um, uh, and and the, um, a number of witnesses thought it might be helpful um, to have an infrastructure levy, but they had concerns about the lack of clarity in the bill. Again, all of this has been on the record for some months. 
uh, and what these amendments are designed to elicit from the government, hopefully today, but if it's for some un inexplicable reason not available today, then at least between now and stage three, greater clarity about all of these important points of detail, um, which are required, convener, in the interest of ensuring that our planning system um, uh, does not allow for the continuation of something which is clearly wrong in the planning system at the moment, which is that the lack of adequate infrastructure is a stymie on effective development. That effective development is needed in Scotland in order to boost the Scottish economy. We clearly need to address this. Um, uh, I repeat that I'm glad that the government is seeking to address it in these gestures towards an infrastructure levy that we have in Section 28 and in Part 5 of the bill, but I'm simply encouraging the government to go faster and harder and be much more committed uh, in, in the, uh, to, to this than um, it seems to have been as this bill was being um, put together. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, Andy Whiteman to speak to Amendment 99 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you very much, um, Convener. My amendments here fall into two groups, um, 99 to 102 and then and, eight, and 183 in, in, in one group and, and 340 and 41. Um, Mr. Tompkins uh, referred to our stage one report as observation that um, witnesses were generally lukewarm. Um, I would clarify that our stage one report was a unanimous report from the committee. A lot of work was done to try and have a unanimous report uh, in order for it to have greater weight. Um, obviously, some of the language was a consequence of that. Um, uh, I personally am not persuaded that the provisions in the bill for this infrastructure levy um, are, are indeed warranted. Uh, Mr. Tompkins highlights one of the policy reasons for introducing the regulation-making powers, namely the Supreme Court uh, decision. But that in itself raises some quite significant policy issues about who should pay for infrastructure and how it should be uh, planned. Um, we've heard from witnesses, I, I recall, um, uh, Homes for Scotland were very, very clear that what we need in an infrastructure first approach in the planning system is to get the key stakeholders round the room, Scottish Water, SEPA, Transport Scotland, Planning Authority, uh, whomsoever else, <clears throat> in order to be able to better align capital programmes around investment in public infrastructure with development plans. And I think that there's a broad agreement that in principle that's what we should be trying to do. It's important to note that when we're talking about infrastructure, we are talking, and the bill makes clear, the kind of infrastructure that would be supported by a levy. We are talking about public infrastructure. The question then is, who should pay for that? I'm very, very clear that that should be paid for by the public purse. I want to see a shift um, from a planning system and a development system that is substantially driven by private interest. It's essentially a privatised system now where private interests put forward propositions, put forward sites, and, and drive this system. And as a consequence, Section 75 came along and we started expecting, and now we're proposing, uh, that further financial provisions will be made by private interests. Um, I reject this. I want to see a shift to a public-led uh, development, and that would include appropriate provision for infrastructure. And I want to see the wide adoption of land value uplift mechanisms at the outset in order to be able to uh, support um, uh, development. So rather than having a, a backloaded system of demanding fees um, from people at far rather that was done um, up front. The, um, I think the, it's the explanatory memorandum or maybe the financial memorandum indicates that the infrastructure levy will raise in fact very little money. It's unclear how this will work in discussions recently, we were talking, for example, about the speculation that Edinburgh's population will increase quite substantially over the next 20 years. That may require the construction or the uh, extension of water supplies in the Scottish borders. If I want to build, apply for consent to build six flats in Leith, um, should I pay for, contribute towards the um, water supplies? being constructed in the borders for, for Edinburgh, um, yes, but not through an infrastructure levy. I'll be voting to get rid of the provisions in Part 5, and those are amendments 99, 100, 101, 102, and 183, 
Uh, I don't believe that this, these provisions, these regulations, uh, which give wide scope to ministers to introduce such a power, um, are justified. Um, but on the basis that this may not be supported, um, I've also lodged Amendment 340 that makes the levy subject to a super affirmative procedure uh, in Parliament. I've also lodged Amendment 341 that introduces a sunset clause, um, although I note, um, in fact, I thought I had noted at the time, but obviously I hadn't fully, um, that uh, this has already been proposed by the Minister in Amendment 274 in a rather more <coughs> succinct and uh, elegant form. So I'll not be moving 341, uh, but I will be uh, moving uh, Amendment 340 uh, regarding the um, need to have a more uh, fulsome uh, consultation with Parliament over the regulations, which these are regulations that will introduce quite a big shift uh, in policy, and therefore that's why I don't think we should be having this in the first place. But if we are going to have it, then I think there needs to be enhanced scrutiny of that in Parliament. Thank you, convener. I, I, mo I move. I'm not moving anything. No, no. <laughs> Thanks for the effort. Uh, Alexander Stewart to speak to Amendment 64 and other amendments in the group. Thank has you, been convener. A long planning build Thank you, convener. Happy to do so. Uh, these are more of a, a 64 is more of a technical uh, amendment. Uh, this section permits Scottish ministers to modify sections 29 of the bill so as to change and clarify the meanings of infrastructure in relation to parts of the bill and the schedule. The bill, as introduced, contains two schedules. Uh, this amendment clarifies the intention to refer to Schedule 1 of the bill in Section 30. And 65, uh, this amendment inserts the review requirements in relation to infrastructure levy powers. As the committee noted in its Stage 1 report on the bill, it is not good legislative practice for powers to be granted only for them to either lie on the statute books unused or for subsequent governments to seek to use them many years later, potentially in ways not originally envisaged. Uh, this amendment introduces a clause requiring the Scottish ministers to review the obligations of the part of the Act relating to infrastructure levies and to lay a report on the conclusions of such review before the Parliament. Uh, such reviews give opportunities for scrutiny of the government's decisions relating to part of the bill and enhanced accountability. Uh, a three-year period within which the review must be carried out will ensure that there is sufficient time for the legislative to be enacted and regulations to be introduced should Scottish ministers wish to do so while ensuring that matters are kept under review in a timely manner. Thank you, Convener. Very much. Uh, Minister, to speak to Amendment 274 and other amendments in the group. Uh, convener, um, I would firstly like to remind the committee of how proposals for uh, uh, an infrastructure levy came about. Uh, the independent panel uh, raised concerns about the limitations of Section 75 planning obligations and said much could be gained. Uh, from a well-designed levy that takes into account development viability, and that idea was widely supported. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, subsequently commissioned extensive research and discussed the matter fully with stakeholders, um, and it's fair to say uh, that we have not yet found the perfect solution. However, I remain uh, convinced that the concept of a levy is worth pursuing as it could play a key role in supporting uh, the delivery of future uh, development. Um, one of the things which I would emphasise um, is that well-designed levy. It has to be a well-designed levy. Uh, and we have an ongoing programme of work on planning uh, and infrastructure uh, with the Scottish Futures Trust. Uh, and we've also established an infrastructure delivery group uh, who will be well placed uh, to help us with this. Um, we have to, uh, as I say, do further work. Um, it is uh, practical to do so. And I understand that Mr Tompkins and, and others uh, may want to, uh, to see us move at, at speed but I am more concerned about that well-designed, uh, workable uh, levy. Uh, and we will continue to look at detailed design, but of course that detailed design uh, partly depends on what happens uh, with the final provisions of this bill. Uh, but we will progress uh, the infrastructure levy as a priority um, if the 
committee decides to keep the levy um, in and we will progress in 2019. I'll take Mr Simpson, uh, convener. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the point that Adam Tompkins uh, was making um, is that you've got something uh, in the bill which has uh, not been um, thoroughly thought through. I think you've admitted that yourself. Um, and what Mr Tompkins was uh, pressing you for was a commitment that um, more work would be done uh, for stage three. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we've had a number of amendments, uh, mainly from opposition members, which have not been properly thought through. Um, uh, and I think this, this falls into that category. So can you commit today to um, do further work ahead of stage three? Um, what I have said, convener, is that we are continuing to work on this um, with uh, other partners. Um, what I cannot commit to um, is that that work will be complete uh, before stage three of this bill. Uh, as I said um, previously, uh, we all, I'm sure, want to see uh, a well-designed and workable um, levy. Um, we had some uh, initial uh, work done, as people are well aware. Um, I was a, a bit sceptical around about some of that work and the findings um, and have instigated further work uh, to go on to make sure uh, that uh, if we uh, move forward uh, with uh, this levy, that it is the right thing for all. Uh, the right thing um, for um, uh, councils, the right thing for the public sector and the right thing for all stakeholders who uh, are involved. Um, uh, and I commit uh, to the committee that we will continue uh, to do that work. Um, and as that progresses, I am more than happy uh, to speak to uh, the committee uh, about where we are at. But I cannot guarantee um, that work would be completed before stage three. Um, convener, there cannot be many members here um, today who have not heard uh, concerns and questions about the impacts of new development uh, on infrastructure pr provision within their area. Uh, we need to give local authorities better tools to ensure that existing uh, new and growing communities have access to the uh, facilities and infrastructure that they need. And the public sector uh, cannot, cannot pay for this on its own, but contributions from developers need to be fair um, and should not deter the development that we need. Uh, a levy, a well worked out levy, has the potential uh, to achieve that. So clearly I don't support Mr Whiteman's proposals to remove the levy provisions altogether. Uh, given his strong support for adding other land value capture mechanisms elsewhere in the bill, I'm slightly puzzled why he would want to remove the one that is already here. In my view, um, the affir affirmative procedure allows this Parliament the appropriate opportunity to scrutinise the regulation, so I don't support Amendment 340 in the name of Mr Whiteman. And I must point out that Mr Whiteman's procedures only apply to the first regulations under Section 27. Uh, they would not affect any subsequent regulations under that section. I've taken account of the concern of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to ensure that there should be proper consultation. Uh, and my Amendment 277 requires ministers to consult local authorities and others uh, before making regulations. That consultation will be open and transparent and the Parliament will have access to all of the published responses as well as the analysis of responses. On the basis of that evidence and whatever other evidence gathering members may choose to do, it will then be up to the Parliament to decide whether to approve the regulations or not. And um, I'll take Mr Whiteman, convener. Um, the Minister mentioned that the public sector can't pay for this, so two points. Does the Minister accept that capital budgets of public sector infrastructure providers on roads and drainage and sewerage and education and health should be aligned with development plans as much as possible? Does he, does he agree with that general proposition? And secondly, does he agree that the majority of development that comes forward doesn't require 
a levy to be introduced because the existing se section 75 provides adequate uh, provisions for raising the sums of money for infrastructure that is directly related to that particular development. Uh, Mr Whiteman has heard me uh, speaking on a, a number of occasions um, uh, saying that, in my opinion, uh, local authorities should do more uh, to align capital budgets um, with their local development plan. Um, I was a strong uh, believer of that when I was on a local authority myself. Um, and I do think that uh, when uh, development plans are being formulated, um, that cognizance should be taken of what infrastructure is required in that area uh, to ensure that that development could go forward. But I would reiterate the point um, that I don't think that the public purse can pay um, for all new infrastructure uh, to deal with all new developments. Um, unlike Mr Whiteman's proposal, uh, the consultation requirement created, created by uh, Amendment 277 will apply to all infrastructure levy regulations, not just the first set. So I hope that members will support that. Um, I recognise that the committee have concerns that the power uh, to establish an infrastructure levy may remain in legislation but never actually be implemented. Uh, and we have here a range of measures seeking to address that issue. Um, I don't think that Mr Tompkins' proposal that regulation should be laid within a year of royal assent is reasonable, and I'm pleased that he um, uh, says that he uh, he's not going to move that today, um, because I, I, I would rather that we had the uh, time to ensure that we reach that preferred model, develop that preferred model, and undertake proper, comprehensive consultation. Um, if the committee wants us to get the levy right, that is the um, the right thing to do. Um, I also don't believe Amendment 65 in the name of uh, Mr Stewart is, is particularly helpful as it requires ministers to review the operation of Part, part 5 of the bill within three years of royal assent. Um, and it seems to me that if uh, ministers are taking forward regulations within that time, uh, there will be evidence of research and consultation and progress. And if not, there will be little to review. Uh, in my view, this adds uh, unnecessary procedure and would take resources uh, away from possibly working on the levy. Uh, my amendments 274 and 290 uh, will mean that the power to establish a levy will lapse if it is not used within 10 years of royal assent. Uh, we do need to allow a reasonable time for the detailed design and consultation that is needed and to introduce the levy in an orderly way. Um, I can understand if the committee feels 10 years is perhaps a touch generous um, and I'd be happy to negotiate a final day to be, date to be put forward um, at stage three. Um, I'll take an intervention from Mr Stewart, convener. Mr Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Oh, sorry, Mr Simpson. I beg your pardon. That's okay. Sorry, we're, Graham. We're, we're very alike. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I think um, yeah, I, I'm pleased to hear that mini the minister say he's o open to a discussion because um, my gut feeling is 10 years is too long. Um, we'll support the amendment, however, but uh, um, I do think it needs uh, amending for stage three. Uh, I'm not sure what the right figure is, maybe five, but we can... <laughs> We, we can discuss that. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure that we can negotiate um, at that point. I, I am open to all of that. I, as I said, I do think that maybe 10 years uh, is a touch generous. Um, convener, Mr Whiteman takes a, a different approach with his Amendment uh, 341 in seeking to provide that the levy regulations themselves uh, would fall after 10 years unless renewed. I, I assume it's intended to require renewal every 10 years but in fact, because of the way the amendment is drafted, it would only seem to require one renewal. In any case, I don't believe it is necessary to make renewal of the regulations a statutory requirement. If the regulations are working well, and if the levy is based on a formula that automatically moves with the economic situation, for example, linked to development value, uh, there would be no need to, to review them. If there are problems or the formula needs to be updated, uh, I'm sure the government of the day would do so. So I don't support Amendment 341. Uh, convener, I would ask the committee to support Amendments 274, 290 and 277 in my name uh, and not to support the other amendments um, in this group. 
Um, convener, I am committed uh, to uh, establish a, a well-designed levy uh, and I also commit uh, to update updating the committee uh, as we move forward uh, uh, with this. Thank you very much, Minister. And Adam Tompkins to wind up. Uh, thank you, Karina. I, I think this has been a debate well worth having. Um, I um, don't agree with everything that Mr Whiteman said, but I do agree with him that the uh, issue on the table here is who should pay for infrastructure. I, I don't agree with him that um, we should expect all of Scottish infrastructure should be to be paid for exclusively out of the public purse. I agree with the Minister that we need to have a hybrid model. We indeed do have a hybrid model where there is a mix of public and private um, capital investment in the nation's infrastructure. It seems to me that that is um, appropriate. It also seems to me it's the only realistic way of going forward, I I imagining that the entirety of our infrastructure can be paid for um, but by public corporations is as unrealistic, it seems to me, as imagining that it can all be paid for by the taxpayer. We need a mix of public and private partnership uh, in, in this, and the issue is that the current mix isn't working well enough um, to accelerate uh, or even to facilitate the kind of development that we need right across Scotland in rural and in urban communities because of the limited nature of Section 75 orders, and this issue needs to be looked at afresh. That was the uh, view of the independent panel, as the Minister um, uh, pointed out. It is the view of the Scottish Government. It is a view which uh, I, I support. Um, but Mr Whiteman is right that you know, there's a fundamental question of policy here about what the relationship uh, sh is and should be between the contributions that we should uh, legitimately expect from the public and the private um, purses in terms of uh, infrastructure and development. Um, I, I completely agree with the Minister that the infrastructure levy must be well designed. But Minister, with respect, you've had years to design it well. Uh, the current review of planning commenced in April 2015. That's three and a half years ago. Uh, the review um, of the independent panel was published uh, in May 2016. That's two and a half years ago. This bill was published 11 and a half months ago, nearly a full year ago. And in your contributions with respect, you are unable to point to a single concrete development that has happened uh, in the intervening 11 and a half months in terms of taking this policy forward. This is incredibly disappointing, right? Well, the, 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 my amendments are designed to accelerate, not decelerate your, your thinking here. Of course, the infrastructure levy needs to be well designed. Um, but there is, the, you, years have already elapsed to, I, I will in a minute, Minister, years have already elapsed to enable you and your officials working alongside the infrastructure delivery group and others, I'm sure, in consultation with stakeholders, in consultation with this committee, to design it well. Um, uh, and, and you, with respect, have not given me confidence that there will be significant further progress between now and stage three, and that is disappointing, but I'll let you back in. Um, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Mr Tompkins will be aware um, that we carried out uh, a, a number of uh, uh, works uh, in terms of research and all of this in order to get this right. Um, uh, as I said in the stage one debate, I was not happy with what we got back and that's why we have put in place uh, what we have done. Uh, but beyond that, in order to actually uh, prog progress certain aspects of this, we actually need to see um, what is going to come out of this bill in order to get this absolutely right. I am uh, committed, as I say, to getting this right, um, I, but I, I, what I do not promise uh, the committee is speed, because I do think that in order to get this absolutely right, we need to have all stakeholders on board and take cognizance of all views. I think the last thing that any of us would want would be to implement uh, an infrastructure levy um, that has happened in certain other places, which has not worked to the benefit of communities or for economic development. Indeed, Minister. I mean, I, I don't want um, a poor infrastructure, an ill thought through infrastructure levy um, to be in place uh, in Scotland any more than you do. But equally, um, uh, I don't want this all to be pushed into a this is all a bit too difficult box and for excuse after excuse to be piled on justification of justification for, do it, for doing nothing because the, the current system is not working. We need to address that. This bill is a an ideal, is the ideal vehicle for addressing that. These provisions don't go far enough to address that. And one second, Mr. Whiteman, these 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 provisions don't go far enough, in my judgment, to to address that. And I would encourage you again, uh, with with your officials and with your um, uh, consultees, to accelerate the work that I know that you're doing and which I support you 
um, uh, in, 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 your, in your endeavours uh, so that Parliament can at least be better informed when we revisit this bill at stage three, even if you haven't yet found what you've described uh, as the perfect solution. Let's not, let's not allow the um, perfect to be the enemy of the good. This is a concept which is worth pursuing, and it's worth pursuing aggressively, and it's worth pursuing at, at greater speed, I would respectfully suggest, than has um, hitherto been evident. Happy to let Mr Whiteman back in. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tompkins. He <clears throat> mentioned earlier about the balance between the private and the public sector. <clears throat> uh, he'll be aware, of course, that public, public sector um, uh, expenditures derived from a very, very wide basket of taxes. Does he not appreciate that for an infrastructure levy that may, as an example, be used to pay for a very large investment in expanding the public water supply for the city of Edinburgh, that it is inequitable for those who are ultimately paying for new development, which in the case of houses will be home buyers, they'll effectively be paying this levy. But all the existing residents of Edinburgh who will benefit from an upgraded water supply, for example, will not be paying anything towards that. And that's fundamentally inequitous. Well, no, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a fundamental unfairness there, but I do, I do think um, that Mr Whiteman puts his uh, finger on, uh, on the issue, which is that we need to have an honest and robust conversation about the appropriate balance between public investment and private investment in terms of delivering the infrastructure that Scotland needs to, to, to drive forward the development that we all know that the economy needs. Um, that, 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 that's the point. I'm seeking to agree with Mr Whiteman rather than to, um, uh, to disagree, but we can make it into an argument if that's what he would prefer. Um, uh, uh, convener, I think enough has been said uh, about these amendments. Certainly enough has been said about these amendments uh, by, by me, so I'm happy to wind up at this point. Thank you. And uh, could you tell us if you're pressing with or withdrawing Amendment 308? Um, withdraw. Thank you. Uh, Adam Tompkins wishes to withdraw his Amendment 308. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? Thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. I call Amendment 309 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated, debated with Amendment 308. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Not to move. Thank you. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Graham Simpson to move Amendment 25 and speak to all amendments in the group. Um, well, thank you uh, very much, Convener. Um, I think I might be right in saying that this is the final uh, group of amendments um, that we're dealing. Uh, no, uh, so I won't speak for very long. Um, no, I, uh, I won't speak for very long. Certainly not. Certainly not as long as the minister will probably speak for. Um, but uh, um, we'll, all, we'll all be relieved that it's the final group. Um, I, I'll be speaking to um, my just my three three amendments, which is uh, 25, 26, and 27. Um, now, the committee's uh, stage one report stated, "quote The infrastructure levy, as proposed, will not be a game changer that will fundamentally alter and remove blockages from the system." We agreed that if it introduced, "quote." it will likely be more effective in some circumstances and in some places than others. This is because of differences in the volume and nature of development and the potential impact of the infrastructure levy on the financial viability of developments. We, as a committee, were deeply concerned about the powers in the bill that enable ministers to collect and redistribute all the levy funds to councils as they wish. This power seems counter to the Scottish Government's intention as set out in the policy memorandum for the levy to be, quotes, both collected and spent locally with the potential for authorities to pool resources for joint funding of regional level projects, close quotes. The committee's report stated that we support the principle that money raised locally should be spent locally. Um, and that's the intention uh, behind the amendments 25, 26 and 27. The bill as introduced uh, provided the government with the ability to require councils to transfer to ministers some or all of their levy income and these monies uh, to be distributed among councils. Um, and, uh, and for me, uh, it was an example of the centralisation that the minister is in denial about. This undermining of local democracy is, in my view, unacceptable. So we support the principle that money raised locally should be spent locally. So if I can just um, 
comment on uh, Amendment 25. This in inserts the words that the levy should be set by a local authority. Uh, everything after that in the bill uh, remains. Uh, and that seems to me to, to, to be the right approach. 26 inserts one word, local, so that it ensures local infrastructure is funded by the levy. And 27 uh, removes a paragraph where ministers can collect the cash. So it achieves the three things. The levy should be set locally, collected locally, spent locally. Um, and, and that, to, that in, in my mind, uh, is the right approach. Um, we, will, um, we will vote to uh, re retain the levy at this stage. I'm disappointed uh, in, in, in the Minister's uh, comments uh, um, previously. Uh, we'll, I guess, save it, um, as we save local place plans. But it needs a lot more work for Stage 3. A lot more work, Minister. Um, and I think that uh, hopefully my uh, my amendments uh, are a step in the right direction, um, just a step. But it is what this committee asked for, uh, and it's uh, it's the right way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia Beamish, to speak to Amendment three four two and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I just intend to speak to my own amendments. Um, uh, perhaps members will be pleased to hear this being the last section. Um, I, I do note what the Minister has said about um, the commitment to, um, in his remarks on the previous group, uh, to a well-designed um, levy and a workable levy. I do, um, though, have concerns about the speed at which things are developing, and I, um, uh, I, I do hope that the Minister might be able to bring something back at Stage 3. I do intend to um, highlight these amendments anyway, um, and, uh, and we'll see where we go with it. Um, so uh, I am going to speak to amendments um, 342, 343 and 344 together as they are in interconnected. These amendments are to expand the potential recipients of the bill's proposed in infrastructure levy to include national park authorities. And section one of the 1997 Act stipulates that all planning authorities are local authorities, but uh, national park authorities are unique as they are not local authorities, as we know, but can be planning authorities under certain circumstances, as outlined in section 26 of the 1997 Act, um, as does section two of the National Park Scotland Act 2000. Uh, based on the current text, the levy would not be payable to national park authorities. Uh, by switching local, as, a, as the word in the, in the text of my amendment to planning authorities, and with the amendment uh, 344, which clarifies the fact that national park authorities are to be considered as planning authorities, um, this problem is uh, resolved, although these things are never as simple as they seem. I believe um, the terminology is consistent with other parts of the bill, and it is right to make the language more inclusive. Uh, national parks bring huge benefits through sustainable land use and sustainable development, and focus on conserving our natural environment and our cultural heritage. The infrastructure levy would, in my view, be a welcome boost <coughs> to funding um, to this further important work. And uh, finally, my amendment 345 adds nature conservation management measures to the existing interpretation of infrastructure as found in section 29. Uh, members will be aware that this section currently includes a list of matters such as communications, uh, flood defence systems, uh, supply of water and energy, and importantly, educational and medical facilities. And I won't go through, won't um, rehearse the whole list because members know, know them better than I. Uh, but it does not make reference to green infrastructure needs. Nature conservation management measures are an important addition here in order to allow contributions to be used for strategic habitat mitigation and enhancement to biodiversity. The amendment is drafted quite simply with the intention that it could then encompass green infrastructure, but also, uh, and I quote from the amendment, access management measures for biodiversity. Um, this it, uh, can include a variety of measures intended to prevent, uh, minimise disturbance or damage to wildlife and habitats. And uh, in my view, this could help address the residual and cumulative effects of development 
and therefore might um, also possibly um, help to facilitate further development in some areas. Um, this could help public bodies to meet their biodiversity duties, and we'll all be aware that, um, uh, although Scotland isn't the, certainly the only country, um, dare I say, in Europe still, uh, which um, has these um, issues in terms of meeting international targets, um, that, uh, that there are strains on local authorities to and some biodiversity officers are no longer in place and there are issues of assessment here. Um, and I think the bill um, would better reflect the strategic environmental assessment, which specifically refers to the multiple benefits of green infrastructure. Um, so as Scotland's uh, planning policy recognises in paragraph 2, um, one nine, and I quote, green infrastructure and improved access to open space can help build stronger, healthier communities. It is an essential part of our long-term environmental performance and climate resilience. Improving the quality of our places and spaces through integrated green infrastructure networks can also encourage <coughs> investment and development. Uh, and the two are, of course, I would add, not mutually exclusive. I recognise at this stage that members and also the minister uh, will likely feel that the wording is too broad and I've also noted in, in my remarks on the previous amendment uh, that the Minister may not feel that there is the speed to, to introduce the, um, the levy um, at stage three. Um, however, I hope members will feel they can support the principle of the amendment at this stage and if required, I would be happy to work with members and the Minister dependent on his comments to agree a consistent definition for stage three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, speak to Amendment 270 and other amendments in the group. Uh, convener, um, I have no difficulty with the principle behind Mr Simpson's amendments 25, 26 and 27 to ensure that key decisions on the levy are controlled by local authorities. Whilst it would be useful to have uh, an approach which is consistent across the country, uh, we have already included uh, provisions in Schedule 1 uh, that would allow for some local flexibility. Uh, I'm happy to support the principle behind Amendment 25, which would give greater local flexibility in setting the levy rate. That being said, I have some concerns about implementation. Uh, one of the aims of the levy is to improve certainty and to address inconsistent and unpredictable practice uh, relating to planning obligations. Uh, we would not want to end up with a complex system of different levies across Scotland. It could also be a significant burden for local authorities if they each have to set up their levy individually. Uh, there may be a, a, a scope to establish a, a clear framework for local authorities to work within through regulations and guidance, and I would be happy to discuss this further with uh, Graham Simpson with a view to making more considered amendments at stage three. For today, though, I cannot support his Amendment 25 because it does not work technically. It is paragraphs 5 and 6 of Schedule 1 that need to be amended to achieve what Mr Simpson is trying to achieve, not Section 27. Uh, to ensure that there can be no doubt that this is a local levy uh, and not a, a means of supplementing national infrastructure programmes, I'm happy to support Amendment 27 from Mr Simpson, so it is clear that the income cannot be aggregated and redistributed to ministers. I would also ask the committee to accept amendments 270, 271, 272 and 273 in my name, which are consequential uh, to amendment 27. Uh, yes, I'll take in Mr Whiteman. Convenient. I'm very grateful for the minister. Um, <coughs> getting rid of the aggregating powers surely undermines one of the um, reasons why the infrastructure levy provisions are being brought in. And I go back to my example about the water supply from Edinburgh has delivered <clears throat> substantially from facilities in Midlothian and the Scottish borders. If we don't have that aggregate levying power, then the infrastructure levy can do nothing in principle to deliver better water infrastructure for the city of Edinburgh. Uh, what I've said previously, and committee members will have heard me uh, on a number of occasions now, um, local authorities uh, can work together uh, to bring uh, monies together uh, to work 
uh, on projects which have regional um, significance. So I do not see that as a problem. Uh, the committee certainly had a problem uh, with ministers uh, taking uh, the resource um, and then aggregating it out. I'm happy uh, to follow the committee's uh, line on this, uh, but this does not stop cooperation between authorities to aggregate resource uh, to deal uh, with larger infrastructure projects. Um, I do not support uh, Amendment 26 from Mr Simpson. Uh, I want to make clear that the infrastructure levy is to be used by local authorities to support infrastructure projects that benefit their areas. Uh, and Amendment 27, which I'm supporting, will mean that monies raised by the levy will always be in the hands of the local authority um, uh, for the area where the money is raised for them to use as they see fit uh, within their powers. Amendment 26 would add a further unnecessary test of localism on top of that. Uh, and this would give rise to questions as to whether or not a project is or is not local for these purposes. And it is not desirable to introduce this additional hurdle. And the example that Mr Whiteman gave, gave uh, is maybe one of the areas which, uh, uh, which could be affected by that amendment if it were passed. Um, our research has pointed to the importance of strategic projects, those projects which are larger and more complex than local or site-specific projects supported by the existing Section 75 funding mechanism and which are not national projects funded by national infrastructure programmes. It may well be useful for local authorities to join forces to support regionally important projects together. Uh, Amendment 26 could limit their ability to do that, and I would ask Mr Simpson not to move it. Uh, turning to Amendments 343 to 345 uh, in the name of Ms Beamish, uh, the aim for the infrastructure levy is to fund key enabling infrastructure to allow development to come forward. I'm concerned that widening the scope of levy funds to other types of projects while worthwhile in their own right, would divert key funds away from the primary purpose. Through our consultations, uh, those who would be liable to pay the levy have been very clear that they would not want the definition widened too far. I don't believe that nature conservation measures would be an acceptable use of levy funds, as it would not help address infrastructure capacity issues which are acting as a barrier to development. Uh, of course, any environmental impact of a development has to be considered as part of the planning application and mitigation measures are put in place where necessary. On this basis, I would ask the committee not to support this amendment. Amendments 342 to 344. Um, I'll take Ms Beamish. Um, Yes. Yeah, it's just a clarification on the previous <coughs> numbers, uh, Minister. Just uh, uh, that you said it was three four uh, three four five in my name, and I'm not sure that that's it. Three four three two three four five. Yeah, I said at the beginning. Sorry, I'll there. get a. Hearing. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, right, and so uh, uh, sorry. Are you now going to speak about three? Four, I'm going to talk about the others now. Could be. Okay. <laughs> I, I know we're getting to the spoken. end, Kavina. Um, <laughs> it's been a long uh, 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 Amendments uh, 342 uh, to 344, uh, which seek to give national park authorities the ability to receive uh, uh, and spend levy funds, raise some significant practical issues. Uh, national parks, of course, are situated across local authority areas. Um, and so this would mean that there would be two authorities operating the levy in relation to any development within a national park. Local authorities have wider responsibilities for infrastructure provision, uh, and I consider that they are best placed to manage the infrastructure levy, although, of course, they should work with their partners, including the national park authorities, to consider how the funds should be spent. I therefore do not support amendments 342 to 344, and I would ask Ms Beamish not to press them. Thank you, convener. Oh, I've finished. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was speaking, Sorry. Mr. Sorry. Before you, it's a clarification uh, before you stop. I, I, if you're happy, convener, I'm happy to take the this. The clarification either. being? Uh, the, well, the, the actually, it's not a clarification, it's a point. So <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> it's a very quick point. Um, uh, 
you, you did say earlier, um, <coughs> thank you for, for, for taking this very brief intervention, you did say earlier in, in relation to the levy that um, you rejected a different amendment because um, it prevented local authorities working um, on a regional basis. So I'm, I'm puzzled as to why, when national parks are so important and they are formed a, as, as a collective, mm -hmm why you would not see this as a positive um, amendment. The minister's uh, um, already made his case. Uh, Convener, if I can very briefly say I'm happy within the with the local authorities within the National Park to work together on the infrastructure levy and to consult with the National Park, but I don't agree uh, with Ms. Uh, uh, Beamish's amendment, which gives the ability for the national parks to receive and spend the levy right, funds. I think that's I a matter that. for the local authorities who are dealing with these large infrastructure projects. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Graham Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw. Um, well, thanks, convener. Um, I will be quick. I know the committee would like me to be quick. Um, I'll just uh, just uh, come back. Uh, on the minister, I was just che checking the wording of my my own amendments, just so we're abs absolutely clear. Um, so, Amendment uh, 25 uh, would mean that the bill would read that the Scottish ministers may, by regulations, establish and make provision about an infrastructure levy to be set by a local authority. Uh, amendment uh, 27. Sorry. A, a, an yes, intervention. Yes, um, yes. My difficulty in terms of 25, and I would reiterate um, this, is that it does not work technically. Um, it is paragraphs five and six of Schedule One that meet that need to be amended to achieve what Mr. Simpson is trying to achieve, and not Section 27. Right. Okay. I hear that. Um, it's Amendment 26 would mean <coughs> there's a paragraph which would which would now read the income this this is in relation to the levy of the income uh, from which is to used by local authorities to fund or contribute towards funding local infrastructure projects um, so I will be pressing that in fact I'm going to be uh, pressing all three and I'll wind it up there okay yeah, thank you very much uh, Right, so you, you are pressing an Amendment 25 now? I am. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 25? Two. Those opposed to Amendment 25? Five. Amendment 25 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 342 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 25. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Yeah. Thank you. I call Amendment 343 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 25. Claudia, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 25. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 26? Those opposed? Okay. I, I, the, that's three in favour, four opposed. So Amendment 26 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 344 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 25. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 99 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 99? Two. Those opposed? Five. Amendment 99 is not agreed to. Okay. <coughs> Where am I? I call Amendment 270 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 25. Uh, moved, Convener. Okay. Uh, the question is that Amendment 270 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Therefore, 270 is agreed to. I call Amendment 271 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 25. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 271 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Amendment 271 is agreed to. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 25. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The call amendment 272 in the name of the mandate. Sorry, uh, wait, uh, amendment 27 is agreed. I call amendment 272 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 25. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, convener. The question is that amendment 272 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Amendment 272 is agreed to. I call amendment 183 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 183 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> right. uh, the, those in favour of amendment 183? Two. Those opposed? Five. Uh, amendment 183 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 273 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 25. Minister? Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 273 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 273 is agreed to. I call Amendment 100 in the name of Andy Whiteman already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 100? Two. Those opposed? Five. Amendment 100 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 345 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 25. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 101 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of Amendment 101? Two. Those opposed? Five. The, therefore, <coughs> Amendment 101 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 64 in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 308. Uh, Alexander Stewart to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 64 is therefore agreed to. Unanimously. I call Amendment 102 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that, Andy, uh, that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 102? Two. Those opposed? Five. Amendment 102 is not agreed to. I call Amendment 274 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 308. Minister, to move formally. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 274 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 274 is agreed to unanimously. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 308. Alexander Stewart, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 65? Three. Those opposed? Four. Amendment 65 falls. Okay. The question is that Section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. <coughs> I call Amendment 275 in the name of... So, sorry, therefore, se se Section 31 is agreed to. I call Amendment 275 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 269. Minister to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 275 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, uh, those in favour of Amendment 275? Five. Those opposed? Two. Amendment 275 is agreed to. I call Amendment 276 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 326. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 276 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 276 is agreed to unanimously. I call Amendment 277 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 308. Minister, Most convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 277 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Again, Amendment 277 is agreed to unanimously. The question is that Section 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. If 30, section 32 is agreed to. I call Amendment 372. 340 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 341 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 308. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. The 
question is that section 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so section 33 is agreed to. I call amendment 46 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 42. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 46 is therefore agreed to unanimously. I call amendment 153 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Minister, to move formally. I move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 153 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 153 is agreed to. I call Amendment 278 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Minister? Move, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 278 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 278 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 154 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 185. Minister? Uh, move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 154 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 154 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 11. Uh, is, will you, Monica, will you be moving this on behalf Not of Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 42. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour of Amendment 47? Four. Those opposed? Three. Uh, therefore, Amendment 47 is passed. I was abstaining. Oh, I was sorry, my apologies. I, th I thought you put your hand up. Right, that's 421. Yes, yes, sorry. That's amendment uh, 47 is agreed, four, two, one. I, you get that? Yep. I call amendment 48 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 42. And I remind members that if amendment 48 is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 155 due to preemption. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 48 to be agreed to, <coughs> are we all agreed? No. Okay. Uh, those in favour of Amendment 48? Those opposed? And one abstention. That's 421. Uh, and Amendment 48 is agreed to. I call Amendment... Oh, sorry. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 66. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? 69 not moved. I call Amendment 49 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 42. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of Amendment 49? Four. Those opposed? Two, those abstaining, one. Uh, therefore, Amendment 49 is agreed to. I call Amendment 50 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 42. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of Amendment 50? Four. Those opposed? Two. Those abstaining, one. Uh, therefore, Amendment 50 is agreed to. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 66. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendments 279, 280, 281, 282, 283, 284, 285, 286, 287 and 288, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with Amendment 232. And I invite the Minister to move amendments 279 to 288 on block. Moved on block, convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 279 to 288? No. Thank you. The question is there that, that amendments 279 to 288 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those amendments are agreed to. I call amendments. Um, amendment 156 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 241. And I remind members that if Amendment 156 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 20 due to a preemption. Minister? Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. 
The question is that Amendment 156 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Amendment 156 is agreed to. I call Amendment 289 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 232. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved. <coughs> Thank you. The question is that Amendment 289 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 289 is agreed to. Okay, I call Amendment 315 in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 314. Uh, is somebody moving this on behalf of Ruth? Thank you, Kenny. Kenny Gibson to move on behalf of Ruth Maguire. Uh, the question is that Amendment 315 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. 315 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 157 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 269. Minister? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 157 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 157 is agreed to. The question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 210 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 207. Monica? Not moved. Not moved, thank you. I call Amendment 219 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 308. Minister, to move forward. Uh, moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 290 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Therefore, Amendment 290 is agreed to. I call Amendment 291 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 269. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 291 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. If 291 is agreed to. I call Amendment 292 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 269. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. The question is that Amendment 292 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 292 is therefore agreed to. The question is that Section 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, if Section 34 is agreed to. The question is that Section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Section 35 is agreed to. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. In that case, that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Can I thank <laughs> Can I thank the Minister, his officials and all the other MSPs who attended today and previous meetings and all those individuals and organisations who took the time to contact the committee or attend the meeting during the stage two process. That concludes the committee's consideration of the Planning Scotland Bill at stage two and I close this meeting. Thank you.